Hey Tanmay, which language should I use for data science? Hey Tanmay, uh, I want to make my own games. How do I get started? Hey Tanmay, when are you going to teach us how to code Python? Hey Tanmay, for a start. Thank you. You know, what I've noticed over the past couple of years is that you all have a lot of questions for me. And there are still even more questions. And so I decided to go ahead and answer them for you. That's what we're going to be doing this Sunday on the Ask Tanmay special. Matter of fact, have you ever seen a show where the host is the guest? That's right. My name is Michael Francis, and I am inviting you to join us this Sunday, November 1st at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the 30th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. There, we'll be joined by, well, Tanmay, and we'll be answering all the questions you've been dying to ask us. So we hope to see you there, and we hope that you bring as many questions as possible. See you on Sunday. Now, I'm going to be answering the questions that you've already sent to me via YouTube and other social media. But if you do have more questions, please do feel free to send them on the email on screen now, or you can ask me live in the live stream chat. Hey, Tanmay, what's your favorite programming language? Hey Tanmay, what's the best online platform to learn technology concepts? Hey Tanmay, what have you been doing other than coding during the COVID lockdown? Well, it's funny you should ask that, James, because apart from writing a lot more code, I actually did some gardening and I grew some tomatoes. Of course, though, I can't wait to answer all the questions that you have because we're going live in 30 minutes and I'm going to be the guest on my own show. Join us in 30 minutes for the 30th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay, the Ask Tanmay special. I'll be your host with the most, so come on down and let's ask Tanmay some questions. Hi Tanmay, how can I be like you? Paano maging ikaw? Hey Tanmay, which language should I use for data science? Hey Tanmay, uh, I want to make my own games. How do I get started? Hey Tanmay, when are you going to teach us how to code Python? For a start. Thank you. You know, what I've noticed over the past couple of years is that you all have a lot of questions for me. And there are still even more questions. And so I decided to go ahead and answer them for you. That's what we're going to be doing this Sunday on the Ask Tanmay special. Matter of fact, have you ever seen a show where the host is the guest? That's right. My name is Michael Frank. Hello everyone and welcome to the 30th episode of Tech Life Skills with Tanmay. Thank you very much for joining today. My name is Tanmay Bakshi. I'm really excited to say that today's episode is special. It's different uh, from the episodes we've done so far. Today we're doing an Ask Tanmay special. So that means you're going to get to ask me pretty much you know, any question that you've got. Uh, and as a matter of fact, we've already got quite a few that came in before the live stream that we're going to be answering. Feel free to put them in the live stream chat. Uh, regardless of what platform you're on, we're going to get to that and I'm going to get to answer your questions. And of course, that also means that today I am going to be the guest on my own show. And so now I'm going to hand it off to our amazing host for today, Michael. So welcome, Michael. It's time for you to welcome me. 
Well, hello, everybody, and hello, Tanmay. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, if, for those of you who don't know, I was on the student special for Tech Life Skills. Uh, so there isn't really too much to say about me. I'm a McMaster University student. Uh, I love to write code, and I just love everything with tech, and I'm very excited to be here. But I know why you're all here. You're here to ask Tanmay questions. You're here to see him answer it. So let's go straight into that. Ladies and gentlemen, the man that needs no introduction, the LinkedIn top 25 influencer, developer <laughs> advocate at IBM, the Google developer expert, so many titles, I love it, TED and keynote speaker, author of three tech books, which I have in the background, <laughs> uh, incredible books, I've read them all, and he has them too, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Tan May Bakshi, everyone welcome him, as you know, you're all very excited to hear him talk, so let's waste no time without further ado, how are you doing today, Tan May? I'm doing very well, I gotta say, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a nice surprise to be welcomed to my own show this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's very exciting to to be uh, running things. Now, the first changes I'm going to make is this is now actually the the Michael special. No. <laughs> um, so the question, let's just to start off a little slow. I know some people might already know the answer to this question, but just to hear it from you finally, instead of some other publication or whatever the case, what is it that made you get into programming? especially at such a young age? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, well, I mean, as, as, as you mentioned, there are you know, quite a few different resources online that would, uh, that would claim to give you the answer and are all slightly different. So uh, really what, what initially got me into the world of programming was, well, first of all, let, let me start off with um, you know, how old I was when I started. I mean, initially when I sort of started getting into the world of code, you know, nothing particularly advanced or complex, but just generally me being fascinated by the world of code was around when I was five. Um, and the reason for that really was, I mean, as you can imagine, as a five-year-old, there's real, not really much to do all day, right? You're just playing with pretty much anything you can get your hands on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, I had a couple different toys, but the computer was my most, um, was really my favorite toy. And, and the reason for that was because the computer was just so interactive, right? Like, Every other toy had the scope of interaction, but then when it came to computers, it was just infinitely more, right? There was just so many more things that you could do with technology than you ever could with, um, with just a regular little toy. And so, you know, that really fascinated me, you know, whenever the computer would do something as simple as displaying my name on the screen or even just adding two numbers, I would be like, wow, it can do that. How does it work, right? And so my dad used to work as a computer programmer. And so uh, he sort of saw that curiosity that I had and was like, okay, I'll just introduce you to a little bit of code, sort of, you know, the, to sort of fulfill your curiosity. Uh, but then, you know, from there, one thing led to another, and through the snowball effect, I mean, my curious curiosity just continued to grow. Right? It never really stopped. Every time one of my questions would be answered, I would just have more questions to ask. Um, and so, you know, that's how I initially got into the world of code. And I, I feel like one more thing that really helped me was. If you take a look at, to, at today, or really when people get older, they start to look at different fields or different um, you know, things that they want to do because they want to be paid to do it. <laughs> like a, a lot of people will be like, oh, I want to learn how to code so I can be paid X amount of money or so I can you know, become a millionaire by building you know, an application, make my own startup or something. Uh, but then back when I was five, I didn't know people were paid to code. <laughs> so Wait, you guys like, are getting paid? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and so I was like, you know what? I, I, I might as well have fun doing this now. Uh, so the fact that, you know, I wasn't taking it as like, oh, I want to get a job in technology. And I was just like, you know what? Technology is fun to play with. I might as well learn how to code so I can do my own stuff with it. That's really what sort of led me into technology in, 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 in the first place. Yeah, of and that course, curiosity yeah. is, is um, that curiosity was there. And I think that's a very integral part of learning something, especially, you know, getting so proficient at it as you are, is having that curiosity. I've seen it in the classroom. I've seen it uh, everywhere. As the people who are curious are the ones who, who tend to really pick up on things uh, really well. Um, sometimes people ask questions I never even like realized that was the question you could ask. That tends to happen sometimes in my materials classes. There are some students who are just really into the material and they know so much. So they'll start asking questions. I'm like, I didn't even know that was a question you could ask. That <laughs> kind of question would never pop up in my brain, uh, especially at five years old. I remember when I was five, I was I was also very interested in the computer, but I really liked that like Windows 
um what was it called like the pinball game yeah I, yes, i'm not I sure if it was pinball actually. exactly yeah that that, <laughs> that and i think there's a spider-man game that i can't find for the life of me all these like 15 years later mm. um but there was a spider-man game on on the computer and that's what i was really into was just the games on pc which is if i remember correctly actually the pinball one uh, the one on windows xp that yeah, was, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was uh, a classic. Um, and it, it's kind of funny for me because that interest in computers at five, it was almost like like something was saying, like, it's not your time yet. Because computers, like, the, my, the way my curiosity started was when I was about four or five, I really liked computers, but I really liked it for the games. And then I grew up a very avid gamer. Like, I played video games every weekend my entire childhood and then eventually when i was about 13 14 i remember hearing that oh pc games are the best way to play games you got to play it on a pc way better than an xbox or whatever so then i got really interested in in let's build a pc mm -hmm. but then of course you can't build it out of thin air so i had to do my research what is a cpu what is a gpu motherboard all these kind of things and come together with a part list so it's like computers for you, it's like you saw the computer and you immediately wanted to do the coding and, and learn more. For me, it was like I saw the computers, I saw what it could do, I enjoyed what it did for like a good 10 years and I came back and said, okay, but how do you do that? <laughs> so I, I wonder if there are, you know, if you've ever encountered anybody who's had an interest in computers that didn't actually start from this sort of fascination with what it can do. Because like you said, there are people who, who just do it for the money. I know um, there are people in the software engineering programs who absolutely hate writing code, but they're doing it because they know the amount of money you can make fresh out of fresh out of like your undergrad mm -hmm. is easily like in Canada, 60, 70, 80 K. Um, so yeah, I, I just, just as a, a sort of spinoff question is, do you, do you know, not to call anybody out or anything, <laughs> um, but do, do you, have you ever encountered people who, who didn't really seem to have that fascination with, with coding? It's, it's, that's a really good question because it's happened way more than you would ever imagine <laughs> it's not like a, a, a one-off thing i would say there are lots of people and, and that's actually incredibly unfortunate because i feel like here's the thing you know we have these sorts of preconceived notions as to what coding or what technology is like and uh, I feel like this is something that sort of is, is ingrained into us as, as we get older is like, you know, technology um, is, is just something, you know, that geniuses build and, and something that really smart people work with. Um, but what we don't realize is that it's actually a lot more accessible than we think. Right, technology Absolutely. isn't really that difficult to build. It, it's it's kind of like art, you know. Once you get the hang of it, once you get that sort of uh, creative flow, it's it's pretty easy to work with, right? Um, and and I've noticed that there are lots of people that I've actually worked with personally on really complex projects that um, don't really have that fascination for coding necessarily, uh, or for programming necessarily. They have more of a fascination for the output that it produces, right? So more of a fascination for either for example, the application that they're going to build or the use case that they're going to enable, or, you know, as you mentioned, it could be the money that they're going to earn from a job when they actually code. So it, it goes both ways. Um, and I have noticed that when I do work with these kinds of people, they're usually less, um, uh, I, I feel like the wrong word to use would be competent, but uh, they're less sort of, you know, uh, <laughs> the knowledge isn't as deep. With yeah, the exactly. The knowledge isn't as deep because, of course, if you're not interested in something, you're not going to be spending your, you know, free time uh, coding. It's like <laughs> learning I mean, as... more, asking why. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like in our in our last episode, how I said, like, you know, developers that are really passionate about what they do, uh, they'll, they'll take <laughs> vacation from work and they'll be like, oh, boy, time to code my own projects now. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when I when I show you my very primitive coding style and then you look at my code and optimize it. And and you're just like, I'm just like, but mine works. Why are you changing it? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So that happens a lot. And I got to say that it's that, that's actually why I encourage everybody to do what it is that they're passionate about, right? Because you're only really going to be good at something if you're really interested in it. And when you're good at something, you know, that, that you know, converts to, uh, to output, whether that be from, you know, the money that you're going to earn from a job or, you know, things that you're going to enable with that. Um, and I feel like just really quickly a note, is that for programming, the way we can enable that is by actually taking the responsibility, I think, from an educational level and also just from like a parent, a parental level of introducing kids to, you know, as many different fields as possible 
to make it so that kids can figure out what it is that they're passionate about. Because just like how, you know, my dad sort of just showed me what it was like to program at five, and I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> uh, similarly, you know, other kids, if they're shown all these different things at a young age, they have that opportunity to say, you know, I like, you know, it could be a certain video game, it could be building computers, it could be building tech, it could be art, whatever it is, just as long as they're actually introduced to it, I think that's really important. So uh, I feel like um, it's really just a matter of getting, getting kids introduced to it at a young age is really important. Um, but yeah, I've, I've definitely noticed that with a lot of the people that I work with. <laughs> I'm absolutely glad you share that vision because I, um, I volunteer with a few organizations. I started doing that earlier this year that specifically help with getting young kids into mm -hmm. computers and into code. So it's very great to hear that the, the great machine learning guy <laughs> agrees with that uh, sentiment. But I do have to ask, we live in an apocalyptic world. Computers have stopped working. Everything's broken. You are tasked with rebuilding technology, but you can only rebuild one language. The question mm -hmm. is, Tanmay, what is your favorite programming language and why? <laughs> Look, you're kind of putting me in a weird spot because, <laughs> I mean, if I were to really overanalyze your question, I mean, I would be like, <laughs> well, technically we would need, you know, assembly language and, you know, these things, but <laughs> and we would need like the LLVM compiler infrastructure. No. Uh, <laughs> no. So um, if I were to take it uh, more, um, uh, if I were to not overanalyze that question, uh, then I would say, um, as a matter of fact, actually, um, this is, it's good that you asked me this because we're getting a lot of questions from the live stream as well from Akash as to uh, what my favorite programming language is too. So my, I, I would say the programming language that I would want to continue to exist if it was the only one that I could choose would be Swift. And there's a very specific reason for it. And it's because I feel like it's the perfect balance from the programmer's perspective of a lot of different things that we value from a lot of different languages, right? Like in Python, we value being able to do duck typing and just do whatever and the interpreter figures it for you. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that's, that's, that's one style. And then in C, well, C is its own monster altogether, <laughs> right? <laughs> in C, it's just, you know, how close can we get to the actual hardware without having to write assembly code? Um, <laughs> so so, so there's, it, it sort of brings together the best of both worlds. And it does this using a, a, what I would say is some of the most advanced compiler infrastructure for its time, at least. Right, nowadays we've got Rust and all these other programming languages with, you know, all these fancy new systems. But back in 2014, when Swift was released, um, the fact that, you know, Chris Latner at the, uh, at, the, at the Swift team was able to say, you know what, let's not only use the existing LLVM infrastructure that has amazing optimizations and, you know, sort of, I mean, again, infrastructure that's going to help us, you know, write better code. But let's also introduce this brand new intermediate pass for high level optimizations. As a matter of fact, sometimes your Swift code will run faster than C code because the compiler can see more high level structure in your code in Swift that it can then go ahead and optimize for you before doing low level optimizations, right? So it's, 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 it's fun how, you know, Swift works like that. So I would say that Swift would be my number one choice especially because of the new Swift for TensorFlow project. You know, we have all this new capability of being able to, you know, put machine learning technology and sort of tie it directly into the compiler because machine learning is so important. Um, so I would say that would be my favorite language, definitely. That would be the one that I want to uh, sort of bring back from the dead <laughs> in this uh, post-apocalyptic world. But, you know, close second would be Julia. I mean, you can probably tell because my two books are on Swift and Julia. <laughs> um, and then a close third would be Go as well, which there's some fun stuff coming out for that soon too. So um, I, I would say those would be the, the ones that I'd have to choose. <laughs> that is uh, phenomenal. I know you've been trying to get me into Swift for <laughs> some time now. I am a avid Python user. No, uh, <laughs> I, I just know Python very well. I, did, I used to do C Sharp, and then I transitioned to Python, and I kind of just stuck with it. But yeah, I, I know from the, the little that I've handled with Swift, you were there, right? I was yes. typing, I'm like, wow, that is so intuitive. That is so, <laughs> I'm just like, wow, this is actually really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so Swift is, yeah, it's an awesome language. I don't really have too much to say about that. My, my answers for those things are really short because I don't really know what goes on on the compiler side of things. It's just, hey, it's fun to type with. Um, but we do have a question in the chat. Uh, I hope I'm saying this name right, Tassin or Tassin. Mm -hmm. He says, I am moving forward in the world of tech and AI. Elder people and my teachers are telling me that I'm too young for it, though my parents are exceptional. What are your thoughts on that, especially someone who started developing at such a young age? Mm -hmm. Okay, 
So, I mean, first of all, one thing that I will say is that there's no such thing as really being too young for something, right? I mean, if I, look, I, if I started, you know, working with the world of technology when I was five, I mean, you can, you can start working with, with machine learning and AI now. Um, but what, what I would say uh, is that it's helpful to balance a lot of the things that you do, especially at a young age, um, with, uh, with, with, with other things that you're learning anyway, right? So, I mean, for example, technology, that happens to be the thing that I'm most passionate about, of course. Uh, but then there are other things that I, I mean, obviously, you know, do in a way almost kind of have to learn alongside the, the world of technology, uh, but also in a way that I'm also just kind of interested in, right? So like, for example, things like psychology and language are also really interesting to me because, uh, you know, that even ties into AI and like, you know, how exactly do humans, you know, synthesize natural language for abstract thoughts and all these sorts of things is just so fascinating to think about. So there, there are other things that I also do learn alongside the fact that I work with technology so much. Um, so one thing that I would say is that even though at, at a younger age, you might not be able to, you know, get fully engrossed within the world of AI necessarily, right? You might have other things to learn, other things to do. It's never too early to get started, especially if you're passionate about something, right? Because if you're passionate about it, you're never going to be struggling to find the time to, to get something done. It's just going to be something that you do because it is fun for you, right? It's like, you know, whenever I get like a little five minute break between meetings, I just pop open Xcode and I'm, you know, writing something <laughs> because that's, that's just what I like to do. And I feel like it's a pretty similar situation here. If that's what you're passionate about and if your parents are, you know, sort of helping you out because, of course, that, that helps me is, uh, a lot as well. You know, my parents being able to uh, help me with, you know, providing the, the infrastructure to enable me to actually do the work that I do, um, then, then I, I, I got to say that, that um, that's definitely something that you should move forward with. Um, so, again, if it's something that you're interested in, and if it's something that you know you are able to, um, you know, have have fun doing, meaning you're able to sort of seek out the resources, seek out the time to be able to work on it, then I feel like it is something that you should definitely continue working on. Because as you gain this experience, as you get older, you're just going to have you know more and more fun because you'll be able to do more and more things in the future. So uh, I feel like it's 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 never too early to get started as long as you know you like something. Yeah, and 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 two things to that. Because you, you had mentioned a lot of points, I wanted to bring something up. But um, sort of the the first point I had is it also sort of shows how important the role of a parent is, um, specifically because you know like a lot of parents are focused on like oh don't show your kids nudity and all that kind of. But you know kids are very curious people. Um, kids are you know they're going to sort of latch onto anything they see and want to play with it and whatever the case and you can always spark that interest within them and and I know a lot of parents like for example if they want their kid to be smart you know they'll be like if you're getting a 95s on tests it's not good enough and uh, you know like you you have to sort of spark creativity and interest in a topic for kids to enjoy it because even if you look at something as simple as toddlers you know they're very imaginative people they have their imaginary friends they're play dates with their toys, right? So they're very imaginative. And it's almost as if, you know, when you go through school, they're trying to teach you, okay, be less abstract and more concrete and analytical. Um, and that's fine to a degree. But you know, as you see, uh, by the time people are old enough to decide, okay, what do I want to study? Or what do I want to do for a job? Not necessarily for the rest of our lives anymore. It's a different generation. But what do I want to do for a job? You know, people are still very creative with visual arts and music. Um, and I think technology is an aspect of that. I think if you're really into analytical things uh, like I am, I really enjoy math and, and analyzing numbers in that sense. Um, but, you know, I'm not some sort of, ab, you know, like analytical everything something. I like the abstractness. I like creativity. And that's sort of where code comes in because you can have your own logic to a problem. Uh, as you know, we were doing some problems the other day and we're like, okay, this is the ultimate logic hit run. We're only better than 5% of people. What? <laughs> right? And so now we're sitting there saying, how can we do this better? Right? So it gives you that analytical, that process, but you also get the creativity of, okay, how am I going to do this? Um, so, and that's, that's the first point. And the second point is um, sort of to add on with, you know, like, oh, my, the elders and the teachers say I'm too young. Um, the truth is teachers, they don't know. Right. Um, they know the material they're going. I mean, also it depends on sort of the school system, but like they know the material they're teaching you. But, it, you know, in other fields, unless they're unless these teachers are tech experts. Right. They don't really know what you can and can't do. They've only mm -hmm. really known you for a year at mm -hmm. most. And then you're on to a new teacher. So they don't really know what your capabilities are. And 
um, a lot of teachers would just be like, oh, we'll just, you know, throw it away. Like, oh, you're too young, uh, whatever the case, just because that's, you know, what's in their head. But if teachers, you know, gave you the push and, and, and help guided you, I know I had some teachers that did that, especially in, in my elementary and high school. If they give you that push and they and they help you out, then, you know, it helps you to achieve. But people who are blockers are always gonna, just going to try and stop you. They're always just going to be like, no, you can't. You're too young. Or you're not smart enough or whatever the case. But if those same people who are blocking you turn into people who are helping you, you can always achieve uh, whatever it is you're trying to achieve. So I obviously listen to your teachers, study hard, that sort of thing. But in the sense of if it's not really academics related and it's not part of your curriculum, you know, what they say isn't the thing that goes. You need to follow what you're passionate about on your free time. But of course, you know, stay up with your studies. Don't start failing out of your class because you're learning AI. Uh, I'm someone who's really bad at chemistry. I mean, my first year of university, I failed chemistry. Um, but I've always loved quantum computing. It has a little bit of physics in it, which I'm good at. But um, quantum computing, but specifically looking at the quantum world, the chemistry of the quantum world is very interesting to me. Pauli's exclusion principle, all these superposition, blah, blah, blah. I'm really good at it because I have an interest in it. But just general chemistry um, on a larger scale when you're dealing with atoms and, and um, you know, reactions and stuff, I'm not too well with that. So that's where I tend to struggle. Uh, so a chemistry teacher would tell me, no, don't go quantum. You're not good at chemistry. How would you expect to do well in quantum? But when you actually look at me and how much I know with quantum, you'd be surprised. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, actually, if I, could, if I could kind of interject there, I mean, it, it makes yeah. sense because even within quantum, there are all these different things you could do, right? You're interested with technology. It's always possible to become a, a kiss kit developer, right? You, you work on <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> right. So th there's all those sorts of things. I mean, what you mentioned about creativity and technology, you're absolutely right. The other day we were working on that problem and we were like, what? How, how is this only faster than five percent? And I feel like some of the technologists that I know are actually some of the most creative people that I know. I mean, like you know this. I was working on this uh, project at IBM that I've talked about sometimes uh, about about some time uh, called Analyzer. And you know, throughout the uh, months that we were working on the compiler tooling for the project, you know, we would come up with all kinds of insane ideas as to how exactly we could call trace as quick as possible literally down to shaving off cpu cycles um and <laughs> and you know one of the ideas i came up with was what if we were to take every function and make two copies and make one the direct copy that's called from like shared libraries and make one the, the copy that's called from other functions that have made copies and it was you know this whole thing <laughs> as to how we could get the most efficient call tracer possible and we ended up coming into a pretty good creative solution, right? And there's a whole talk that we've done at, uh, at IBM Think on that. So I would say that, you know, creativity, technology creative, right? We think of it as just this like purely analytical, you sit down and you, uh, you know, you, you write code all day or you, uh, you know, um, you're, you're, you're doing math all day, but that's not the case, right? It's, it, it, it really is an art building advanced Absolutely. technology systems. So in the chat, we have Seasley uh, who is asking a question about swift programming not necessarily but it ties into my question uh that i had for you next so it's perfect uh Seasley says swift programming is not taught in schools and universities they only teach java and python um and there are some other languages that are taught but you know it's a generic c plus yeah. plus and all that stuff so that next question then becomes what do you think is the best programming language for a beginner Ooh. Swift, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> Assembly, um, you need to know every, no. <laughs> every architecture, get started. No, um, two things. First of all, I, I must say that I really, really think the education system needs to evolve. And I say Absolutely. that in the sense of, you know, even taking a look at like Java, right? Java is incredibly outdated. Please stop teaching Java. <laughs> if you got to use the JVM, use Kotlin. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's fully interoperable. Use it. <laughs> it's, Absolutely. It's, it's like saying, you know, we've got two different technologies, A and B. They both do the exact same things, but B is modern and way better than A. And for some reason, we still teach A. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see why. Uh, so that, that's, that's one thing, first of all. Uh, if you've if you got to teach something with a JVM just because, you know, legacy applications, right, then teach Kotlin. I mean, honestly, it's kind of like saying we're going to teach everybody COBOL just because lots of legacy applications are on mainframes and you're going to be working with mainframes. No, you don't. So that, that, that's one thing. Apart from that, good languages for beginners. I would say that it depends on what you want to do. 
right? And the reason I say that is because programming languages are tools, and you know every every programmer is going to be using a different tool to solve a different problem. And every programmer is working on different problems, right? So like for example, I remember actually you know in our, in our promo video, uh, Ahmed sent in the question about um, you know how can I build my own games? Well then. You know, if you, if, if you know that what you want to do is build games, then maybe a great way to get started would be C++ or potentially C Sharp, unfortunately. Um, there are all these different <laughs> <laughs> languages uh, that, are, that are great for game development in specific that you might want to focus, uh, focus on, you know, just, just so you can uh, get started immediately. But then if you take a look at the other sort of uh, way of, uh, of thinking about it, let's just say you know that you just want to do simple automation and scripting, right? So like, for example, I went to Slovakia this one time and I found out that a pretty good, you know, section of jobs is just people sitting down and copying shipping numbers from one page to another and people are paid to do that. So if you know that's pretty much all you need to automate, then learn Python, right? Doesn't matter if it, your code is slow or it's inelegant, it just needs to work, right? So same thing that you mentioned, Michael, my code worked, why'd you need to optimize it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah, that's fine. Um, and, but then if you want to do like general purpose programming, right? So like if you want, if you're passionate about programming, you love telling computers what to do um, and you want to apply that knowledge across domains then that's where we come in more general purpose languages traditionally you know I would say things like uh, Kotlin Julia Swift of course these are great ways to get started um, and I say that because they're really really modern languages and when you learn them you kind of have to use resources that were built with that modern perception of technology in mind you know for, for example I, I feel like this is actually the perfect example Many, many years ago, you know, decades ago when C was, you know, first sort of, you know, in invented, processors were really simple, right? There were just a couple of stages in their pipelines, um, and and so when we, when you would code in C, there was a pretty direct C to assembly translation, and then there was a pretty direct assembly execution on the CPU, so you had pretty tight control. But nowadays, uh, I like to say that that's mostly an illusion. Right, C isn't really that low level of a language because no matter how much control you think you have, even if you code in raw assembly, your CPU is ignoring your structure, right? Your CPU is completely changing the way your code works to get it to run as fast as possible, right? So your CPU is doing branch prediction, your, G your CPU is you know, doing, you know, doing deep pipelining to automatically execute multiple branches on the same thread. It's doing all these things that you don't even think about. And with the right compiler infrastructure like LLVM, uh, that we C developers get to keep the illusion that they're coding in a low-level language, uh, right? They get to keep the illusion that the language is fast because the compiler is helping them work with the CPU very well. Uh, so when you when you end up coding in a language like Swift, you kind of are forced to learn with that modern perception of don't try to outsmart the compiler because it knows your code better than you do. <laughs> so so. And then, of course, it's such a generally sort of applicable language, all the way from machine learning with TensorFlow um, to you know high performance computing and distributed computing to scripting like Python. You can literally just import Python libraries in Swift, right? You can do all these different things. Um, and then, you know, I said Kotlin again because it's compatible with JVM. As unfortunate as it may be, there are still lots and lots of applications that are built in Java. And so, instead of rewriting millions of lines of code just use Kotlin and suddenly you've got a modern language that is interoperable with all of our legacy stuff. Um, and then of course there's you know specialty languages that I think are good but not necessarily for beginners, things like uh, Go that are great once you've sort of gotten into the world of programming. Um, but again, my top three picks I would say for beginners would be Swift, Julia, and Kotlin. Interesting, Swift, Julia, Kotlin. Just uh, summarize it in that one line. But yeah, no, <laughs> uh, absolutely. I would say, like, I remember I used to be like, oh, yeah, Python, right? But when you were showing me Swift, there are just so many ideas that I just missed out on because my I was in my earlier stages, I did Python. So once you had, once you had begun to master Python and then you go to, like, literally any other language, you start to realize, oh, there are so many concepts I don't really realize exist. Um, <laughs> because you kind of gloss over them when dealing with Python. So I agree with that list, actually. Um, but on the note of beginners, we do have a, a question all the way from Pakistan from Suresh, who says, I'm a university student in chemical engineering. What are your suggestions for the best books for basic programming and machine learning at the beginner level? 
Julia for beginners, but go on. <laughs> you you read my mind. <laughs> um, I, I wonder how you did that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the book that I've got behind me, you've got behind you, and I've got with me now. Uh, um, how many copies do you have? <laughs> lots. <laughs> I mean, I literally wrote it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, well, so first of all, Suresh, thanks for sending in your question. Um, you mentioned your university student in chemical engineering, and one thing that I will say is it's amazing just how many students across all kinds of fields want to learn about technology because if you think about it, technology as a field isn't even its own thing, right? It's, it's, it's infrastructure that acts as, you know, the, the sort of power of so many other industries and so many other tasks. Um, and so that's precisely why, actually, I wrote this book, Tammy Teaches Julia. Um, the whole idea is... Uh, to get you into the world of programming and giving you that sort of sense of computational thinking as to, you know, logic building and actually building real applications and going through step by step why exactly I made every decision that I did in building those apps. Um, so I would say that this would be a great way to get into the world of programming. And actually, here's the fun part. Since Julia is a language meant for scientific computing, um, I actually did a little bit of machine learning at the end and sort of introduced you to the concept and you know, why it's important. And one of my favorite examples that I think you're, uh, you're really going to enjoy um, actually building and, and sort of having fun with your, uh, your own pictures is Deep Dream. So you can generate art like this. <laughs> with, uh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah you're, you're, tell you guys tame would just randomly send a picture of me deep dreamed <laughs> and i'm like where did you even get the picture let alone that you just deep dreamed it <laughs> <laughs> we did that actually in a live coding stream with labib and omer so make sure you check that out too everybody i'll put a link in the description so uh absolutely that was a um, fun episode yeah <laughs> that, that, that that definitely was so i, I would say that tame teaches julia is a great way to get started for sure in terms of uh, in terms of books, um, there are more books that I'm working on. You know, the, ne the next book that I'm working on on the Go language isn't for programming beginners. It's for some. It's for people that already have some experience with programming, even if it's not in depth. Um, so I, I would say Tammy teaches Julia is a great way to get started. And actually, one more thing, I'm very glad to announce for the first time ever actually on this stream um, that after today's stream, sometime today, um, I will be uploading uh, the the first two episodes in a brand new series of videos actually where I'm going to teach you AI or deep learning from scratch. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to be t taking you all the way from, you know, you know nothing about machine learning, although I do assume some programming knowledge, uh, all the way to, you know, you can implement complex machine learning applications. So it's going to be a really fun series. I can't wait for everybody to take a look at it. It's a, it's a lot of content that I've been working on, and I hope you enjoy it. Um, so that's also coming up soon. So Tammy Teaches Julia, you know, that first book in the, in, in, in the series as well as my new series on, on machine learning coming out, uh, coming out today. I just want to throw out, is anyone catching how many like cool sneak peeks I'm getting off of this guy? I'm like the greatest host ever. He said, oh, there's something coming for Go, be on the lookout. And I'll be saying he has a new, you know, a new um, machine learning course on, on deep learning. I'm like, come on, you know what I mean? Let me interview NASA. Let me get the secrets. You know, are there aliens? And let me let me interview them. You know what I mean? But uh, uh, on the topic, though, of deep learning, machine learning, the best languages to learn, the best books, et cetera. The question then becomes with so many different types of emerging technologies, especially when you have something like quantum, for example, on the horizon, why are you interested in AI? <laughs> OK, so uh, this is actually a question that I get a lot. Right. And this is from a lot of different people. You know, people have asked me, why do you prefer, you know, working with AI technology so much over blockchain? Or why is quantum computing not that interesting to you compared to AI? Why, why AI, right? Um, and I got to say, there are a couple of reasons. <clears throat> and the main one actually goes back to when I was 11. Um, so back when I was 11, <laughs> right, uh, as I mentioned, I loved working with technology, of course. Um, but the reason that I loved working with it was because it was so interactive, right? There were just infinite ways that I could use technology. But, uh, and, and this might seem weird, but I kind of felt like technology was also incredibly limiting in a way, because if you think about it, 
you can't really do all that much with technology. And what I mean by that is, at the fundamental level, there are only a couple of instructions we can execute. There are only a couple of you know, rules that we can have it follow. Now, you can put together those rules in you know, an infinite number of ways and make really interesting apps like Zoom um, or, or YouTube, right, without the power of AI. But at the end of the day, it's still just human-coded conditions that we're accessing digitally. So what I really like about machine learning and what sort of re-sparked my interest for computing back when I was 11 was watching Watson play Jeopardy. Because when I saw Watson playing Jeopardy, the thing that went through my mind was the kind of language that even humans cannot properly comprehend, you know, or fully comprehend. We have a computer system that's doing it better than humans. That just blew my mind. I was like, how, right? And so I wanted to be able to build that technology myself. And so I you know, took a look at Watson, took a look at all these different uh, technologies that IBM was working on, and that sort of got me into the world of, of machine learning. And as I, as I went through it, I sort of realized more and more um, that artificial intelligence or, or machine learning technology is, is really all about pattern recognition at scale. And that doesn't sound really fancy because it's not but it's so powerful, right? All the way from your Apple Watch detecting when you've taken a hard fall and automatically you know, calling emergency services, to Face ID on the iPhone, to Tesla's self-driving cars, to you know, Zoom background removal, all of this is powered by machine learning. There are so many experiences today with technology that simply would not have been possible if it weren't for machine learning technology. So I feel like the one thing technology is doing is it's generating a lot of data, especially on structured data, right? things like video, audio, text. And without machine learning, that data either gets deleted or it sits around and does nothing. And with machine learning, we have the capability to take the literal petabytes of data that we're generating and suddenly start to make use of it and enable better user experiences and enable better applications to exist. And it sort of takes on that infrastructural role, like the field of technology itself, right? Like blockchain, sure, it's great. There are a couple fields that will greatly benefit from using it, but that's it. It'll act as infrastructure for those fields. AI is applicable everywhere, right? It could be, you know, a field that's also, you know, helped by blockchain. It could be something as simple as, or I said simple relatively, agriculture. It could be something as complex as healthcare. Doesn't matter. AI is making an impact. Right? So the fact that it is so cross-domain, so general purpose, so uh, impactful to the point where we ignore it now, we're like, yeah, of course we can do Face ID Unlock. We've been able to do that for years now. The fact that we take it for granted, that's what really makes me interested in, in artificial intelligence. So you, you really, you very much enjoy the many different applications you can have for it, uh, essentially, which is really interesting. I, I like that parallel it draws because the reason I was so interested in quantum was just because I've always kind of just liked hardware and seeing the tricks people pull to make hardware better. Um, like AMD recently announced their new RX 6000 GPUs. Um, and they said that if you pair it with one of their brand new Ryzen 5000 CPUs, you know, they have their infinity cache where you get... Uh, I, I actually, I think there might be a separate technology for Infinity Cash, but Infinity Cash for starters, and the the whole idea of um, being able to have the CPU access the whole 16 gigabytes uh, of your GDDR6 GPU rather than just the 256 megabytes at a time, um, and and they're showing that like even before you optimize a game for that, your games are immediately getting a 10, 13 percent boost in performance, mm -hmm. and you can only imagine what happens when when developers start accessing the whole 16 gigabytes. Um, so I, 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 and, and so for me, it's all just like, oh, you know, we have this new way of, of making hardware better and what are all the applications of it? But you like it because you're very much a software kind of guy and you're like, wow, this is just a technology that we can apply in software to all the different fields. Um, so it's, it's very nice to see that parallel. Um, but on the topic you had mentioned earlier about how we're generating all this type, all these like petabytes of structured and unstructured data. Mm -hmm. Um, I do have a question. Uh, about a certain form of structured data, uh, PDFs. Someone okay. says, I want to convert a PDF into an audiobook through machine learning. This is from Sahil Naik, who I believe asked it earlier in the chat, but did already send it in before the show. What do you say about that? Creating an audiobook from a PDF. Gotta say, that's a fun challenge. Uh, yeah. Who knows, maybe it's IBM Research's next grand challenge. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you, Sahil, for sending in the question. Um, 
I will say that's a that's a very very interesting idea but here's the thing PDFs aren't like so so let's, let's just sort of disambiguate first let's go back and let's just think about raw text files let's just say you've got a raw text file which is literally just a binary file where each byte is another ASCII character that's it right no unicode nothing special nothing fancy just each byte is 0 to 255 representing an ASCII character right that's traditionally pretty simple to parse uh, and so you can, you know, figure out what the text is, you can feed that into Watson text-to-speech, and suddenly you've got an MP3 file that you can play, boom, you've got an audio book. Now the issue when you scale up, let's just say to a Word document, is that you've no longer just got ASCII to deal with, you've got Unicode to deal with. How do you pronounce emoji? How do you pronounce, you know, characters in other languages? That's one thing. Then you've also got images, all right? Well, how exactly do we describe an image in an audiobook? How exactly uh, do we, uh, you know, do we want to talk about the caption or not? Uh, then we've got tables. Well, how exactly are we going to talk about the table? Are we just going to go row by row and, you know, speak each, each, each column? I don't think necessarily that's the best way. Do we deal with table captions? Uh, then we've got links. We've got all these different things to deal with in a Word document. Then we scale up to PDF. And in PDF, we don't even have the structure from which to determine what part is what. You don't know if a certain piece of text, just because of the way that PDF, like, you know, is, is stored on, on, uh, through the PDF standard, we don't know if that text is in a table or, you know, in an image or in a text snippet or in a text box. We don't know. So that has actually long been a huge problem within machine learning, not even just for audiobook conversion, but just because businesses have so much essential knowledge stored in PDFs that traditionally humans read, but that they want to feed into, say, Watson Discovery to have Watson automatically sort of ingest their domain knowledge. And so that's why IBM Research has actually been working, seriously, on a lot of different PDF parsing technology because it's a lot more difficult than you might think. Um, they've already got this thing called Smart Document Understanding that they've already published and you can actually go ahead and use it today with the Watson Discovery Service where you upload PDFs and they'll actually let you go ahead and parse out all the different sections of that PDF uh, and, and, and figure out, you know, what, uh, what all of them mean. Uh, you know, is there a table here? If so, what do all the columns mean? You know, what does it mean in relationship to the other, the other parts of the document? You know, it can do all the entity extraction and, and relationship extraction and these sorts of things in PDFs. So I would say that I don't think we actually have the full technology to do that yet. I know it seems like it should be pretty simple. He's ahead of his time. <laughs> <laughs> so you are, you're on the right track. Uh, and I got to say, though, this would be very interesting to work on. I'll take a look at what I can do. Um, if there's a way that we could leverage something like smart document understanding, potentially alongside things like the IBM Project Debater data sets for emotional speech uh, synthesis and things like this, I will go ahead and look into it, and I'll go ahead and respond to you and, and potentially do a YouTube video on that as well. That would be, that would be really interesting. So I'll, I'll take a look into it, but I will say that it's a lot more complex than you would initially think just looking at a PDF. Um, so fun research idea. <laughs> See, Sahil actually already knows how to do it. He's just testing you. Um, wow, look at this guy. He doesn't even know how to convert a basic PDF. No. Uh, yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's interesting all the points that you brought up, especially because as you talked about images, I do remember hearing that, I believe it was Microsoft, yes. that's working on the AI that could actually take an image. They've already and, got it too. Oh, they, they already they, have they, it. They just, they just built like literally a few single digit days ago, um, you know, <laughs> uh, a, a brand new model that just blows everything else out of the water when it comes to image captioning. Like it just, it, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. Uh, and I gotta say, I was surprised. I never knew we had the technology to do something like that today. Um, so Microsoft Research is doing some incredible stuff when it comes to accessibility. So it, it's definitely possible, but it would take some effort. <laughs> I, I like it too because it's almost as an inverse, not that it's happening because of NVIDIA, but it's almost like an inverse of the NVIDIA um, technology where you could actually just like draw something in paint style and it yeah. turns that into uh, its own image. Um, I was about to say, I think it's using a certain technology, but I don't want to be incredibly wrong. So I just won't ask what tech it's using, but um, being able to, to take a drawing and turn that into like almost looking like a picture and then also being able to take a picture and translate that into words for people who can't see the picture. Um, absolutely brilliant technologies that both involve image uh, images with machine learning. Um, but on the topic of machine learning, again, as I guess we always are when we're talking with you, um, we have uh, Pornima 
who asked a question before the show who said, is machine learning knowledge enough to be a data scientist? I wanted to do data engineering, but I'm confused as what would be best. Great question. Thank you, Purnima. Um, so I would say that machine learning knowledge is an integral part of data science. But it's not the only part, right? Like when I, I was in India doing a couple talks with a, a data science organization. And um, I, one thing that I noticed, you know, off the bat is that data science is really misunderstood. Data science is all about the whole data pipeline, right? So this goes from, you know, how are we going to collect data? What are the circumstances in which users are going to be providing us with their data? Is there going to be bias because of the way that we're collecting that data, right? Like if we're, um, if we're capturing uh, text messages uh, to do emoji prediction for the Apple keyboard like they do today um, to see which emojis are, what, are associated with, with, with what words, would we be biased if we're only collecting data from a certain population of people in the U.S.? Do we want to maybe do it internationally? You know? So there, there are all these things about bias and collecting data. Then it's all about how do we store the data? Then how exactly are we you know, cleaning the data to make sure that we don't get any garbage in? How are we then processing the data? Are we gonna use machine learning? Are we gonna do some sort of simple structured analysis? Then how are we gonna make sense of that analysis? And then how are we going to deploy that analysis to production? So data science is about that whole pipeline of from the very beginning, from the, from the edge, right? From where you're capturing the data to where you're actually deploying the data and the experience of the users as they use that deployment. Deployment. I feel like that's what the data science pipeline is all about. People usually focus on the machine learning end because that's the most fun one. But if you really want to be good at data science, you've got to really take a look at that whole pipeline is, is, is what I would say. Now, that doesn't mean you need to do data science, right? If you don't want to do data science, by no means do you need to. You could very easily just be, you know, machine learning engineer or, or someone that actually builds the machine learning algorithms. You know, great, uh, great, great examples. You know, there's tons of people within like IBM and my Google and Microsoft research uh, that aren't by any means data scientists and have zero care in the world for how data is actually captured or, or deployed. They just care about taking in some good data doing some innovative machine learning and delivering those machine learning solutions to data scientists who can then do their work on it, which is in itself, again, an incredible sort of field to get into. So I would say that if you want to do data science, then by all means, feel free to go ahead and learn that whole pipeline. But if you don't want to, you don't need to, right? If you're passionate about machine learning, feel free to you know, specialize in that machine learning element. Um, but I do want to make that sort of distinction between the two. Um, and also, actually, this kind of leads me into one more question, uh, which I'm going to uh, take up really quickly. A pretty similar question, actually, from, uh, from Madhav on the live stream. He's asking, can you please give me tips or learning resources for reinforcement learning? Any, any, are, are there any sort of prerequisites? Uh, the reason I'm taking this up is because reinforcement learning is actually, I think, a really interesting sort of subfield of machine learning. Um, and it ties into data science as well because reinforcement learning is traditionally viewed as, you know, oh, that's what they use to play games. <laughs> but it's, it's not just that. Reinforcement learning has all kinds of practical applications um, that we haven't necessarily explored completely yet. Uh, but it is something that is really interesting. Now, reinforcement learning, I would say, is one of those more complex fields fields within machine learning because there's all kinds of problems that we just really have no clue how to solve like to the point where you know the cutting edge researchers say no we haven't solved these problems yet and they're pretty fundamental issues like how do we get models to explore without overfitting to just you know capturing a single state my favorite example there was a uh, an ai that was uh, being trained to play to uh, break out through uh, through a reinforcement learning algorithm and it was like why play the game when we could just be on the pause screen and never be punished? <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so it would just... Can't uh, lose if you don't play. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> that is exactly what the model thought. And we don't want it to think that. Uh, and so uh, there are all kinds of problems. So in terms of resources, I would say... Um, First of all, cognitiveclass.ai has a couple of great courses on reinforcement learning. I actually already have one, um, which I will also link to in the description. Cognitiveclass.ai is the website. Um, that's a great way to get started with reinforcement learning. However, I would recommend you get started with machine learning first before you get into reinforcement learning, that more sort of specialized subfield once again. Damn, me teaches Julia. <laughs> so, um, uh, so there's all kinds of resources. Of course, there's also my new series that I talked about, about learning deep learning from scratch. We're also going to be covering some reinforcement learning at the end of the series. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned for that. So hopefully that answers your questions, Purnima and Madhav. 
So I have two questions, one for you, and then one I think I'll take a shot at. Um, right. The first one is from uh, Mahendra in the chat. The second one's from Aman in the chat. Um, Mahendra, uh, so basically to preface this question is, you know, you have an iPhone, you, you, you have a Mac, you're an avid Apple <laughs> fanboy. So we know somewhere you have the, the insider secrets. So we need to know the Apple eyeglasses when are they releasing? No, I know you wouldn't know. But um, if if Apple were to come out with with some form of glasses, I'd imagine they'd have some kind of tech in, inside of them. What would you want as an avid glasses user uh, from Apple to put in glasses? Well, I guess it's time for me to break NDA. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tim I, Cook, you, no. <laughs> <laughs> no I, I, I don't actually know anything about that. But... Um, uh, s- what I would say is there have been a lot of different people talking about what Apple might be doing when it comes to, you know, those, those, those glasses. And I got to say, it's a really interesting concept. I mean, they, they kind of, I mean, we wouldn't have modern phones if it weren't for the iPhone, right? That, that, they wouldn't exist. It's plain and simple. It's as simple as that. Um, like without the, you know, brand new multi-touch technology, without, you know, everything that just sort of got packed into one device, we wouldn't have modern phones. And so I feel like what Google Glass attempted to do, Apple's going to be able to do, <laughs> is, is, is one thing. Um, but the way that they do it is definitely going to be interesting. I feel like the reason that we haven't already seen something like this out there is because no matter who would release something like this, they wouldn't be able to integrate it well enough with our lives to actually be useful. Because if you think about it, how much computing power, especially a couple of years ago, could you really fit onto a pair of glasses without making it seem like you've got a whole headset, like a helmet, <laughs> love, right? <laughs> so that, that's, that, that, that's one thing. Taking a look at how they've been able to pack, you know, a couple years ago's worth of iPhone performance in an Apple Watch. That's incredible. So they definitely have, first of all, an advantage in compute power because they build a silicon. That, that's one thing, right? So what I would want is definitely something that works standalone that I don't need to, um, you know, necessarily, you know, buy something else to, 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 to make it work for, like some of the, some of the rumors were suggesting. Um, on the other hand, one more advantage that they have is that all their operating systems still run on the core Darwin operating system. So what that means is, you know, the same software that your phone and your watch and your HomePod and your TV are running, that's more than likely going to be what's running on the glasses as well, meaning that it's going to integrate really well with everything else. So as a developer, that makes my work a lot easier, which, as you mentioned, that's why I use a lot of Apple products, is because as a developer, my life is a lot easier because everything just kind of works because it's all the exact same operating system with a different skin <laughs> and some different Apple. libraries. It just works. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that, that's one thing. So what I would say is, in general, what I would expect from them is, uh, you know, compute power that enables them to be a standalone device, battery life that works at the very least all day, you know, pretty much the standard stuff that I feel like we would, that, that we would want to make this a, a, a real product. And the reason that I'm not giving you more sort of like technical, oh, I want it to have these specific SDKs and I want to be able to code it in this way, is because I know that if Apple's building it, it will, because that's how their systems work. <laughs> all of their <laughs> devices are running the same operating system. They've all got the same libraries. I already know as a developer that I'm going to have fun coding on it. Um, so I, I got to say that just because of the fundamental fact that Apple's building the glasses from a, de- from a developer's perspective, I'm already set, sort of set. <laughs> so, so I, I feel like you install like we're Xcode already... on your Apple glasses. You see the code, like you really see it now. That would it's be all that would your be vision is. Extension, right? Like code on your walls. <laughs> there you go. Um, so a question from Aman uh, was asking, which is the best out of aerospace engineering at IIST uh, or civil engineering at IT, IIT? Um, those are two very different programs. Um, and I know people who've had interest in both of them. So just to, to um, answer that question for you as a university student, the university itself doesn't really matter, uh, especially in a situation like this, because you're picking two completely different programs. Um, but specifically, if you do plan on leaving the area you are in, wherever you may be, um, like for example, I'm you know I'm in Canada. If I do plan on going to the states, where I went to university in Canada doesn't really matter because these universities that are considered the number one Canadian university in the U.S. they don't know what these schools are. They don't, right? If I go, you know, if, if I talk to anyone here in this chat who isn't in Canada and I say, oh, I went to York University for computer engineering uh, and, you know, maybe I, I, I say I want to 
be smarter or dumber or whatever the case you might say. And I come back and say, oh, I didn't go to York. I went to University of Ottawa. Oh, no, I went to University of Alberta. Uh, no, I went to McMaster. I went to uh, Waterloo. You don't know what any of these universities are. So in your mind, you can't really rank, you know, where is this guy on the hierarchy of, of good schools, bad schools. Mm -hmm. But if I do say I studied computer engineering, you know, I studied computer engineering. So, you know, I have that 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 understanding and background in technology and, and whatever the case. So if you're saying what's better, aerospace at one school or civil at the other, the school isn't as important as the actual program itself. Because if you come to me and you say, I studied aerospace engineering, at I, IIST, I don't need to know what the school is to know if I have a civil engineering question, I'm probably not going to go to you. I'll go to the people who I know have backgrounds in civil engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so focus less on which is better, this school and that school, and follow your passion. What do you like? Do you like studying aerospace engineering or do you like studying civil engineering? Uh, I know some people who like aerospace, but there are very few options in Canada to study aerospace. So they chose to just do civil engineering um, at you know schools like McMaster. Um, but in the end, you know, they're not really as passionate about it as they would be with aerospace. So less about following the university, more about following the program, because the program is, is what follows you. When, you know, you say you study uh, civil engineering, you know, that's what they keep in mind. They don't start saying, oh, how does, how does um, IT, IIT compare to uh, Harvard and whatever universities they have in the U.S.? Because people can't compare these universities on such a global scale unless they're in the field of academia and actively checking like world statistics on different universities which mm -hmm. uh, i'll tell you right now most people don't and even in the field of academia most people don't mm -hmm. um so that just sort of uh answers that question because i saw there were some people giving some answers to that in the chat maybe tam may you want to chime in on that uh, very long answer i gave <laughs> no i mean first of all i love that answer it's a, it's a good thing that our host also has uh uh, also has some pretty good, uh, I mean, since you're in university and I'm not, I mean, you're, 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 you're the one that I want, that would answer that question. <laughs> so it's, it, it's good that uh, we, we got the right host for this one. Um, so that, that's one thing. But also, just really quickly, I did want to mention that from the live stream, we got a question from Ryan on saying, can you do more tutorials on some science experiments? I already have a couple from some time ago, <laughs> um, which I will go ahead and put the playlist in the description, but definitely... I will be doing more in the future, so do stay tuned for that. If you have any specific experiments that you want to see or ideas, feel free to put them in the comments, and I'll definitely go ahead and uh, make those tutorials for you. Uh, also, really quickly, I do see that uh, Hrishika had asked a question some time ago. Do you believe that there's an art to writing code? Is it sort of like craftsmanship? Uh, what are your views on it? And uh, we already talked about this a little while ago. I didn't notice this question, so I hopefully uh, we had answered your question some time ago. If not, feel free to uh, uh, put a follow-up question in, in, in the chat. And one more thing that I do want to quickly mention um, is that Akash had asked, you know, if someone's learning Julia, how would they learn, you know, object-oriented programming concepts and other, like, fundamental programming concepts. I mean, as, as, as Michael, for example, you mentioned, when you learn Python, there's so many things that you just end up glossing over and you don't realize are things that you've got to tell computers to do. Um, <laughs> and similarly, in Julia, there are going to be some things that you miss. You're going to miss, you know, objects. But then again, that's with any programming language. In Python, you're going to miss type annotations and compilers. In Swift, you're going to miss... There's not much you're going to miss in Swift, but... <laughs> 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 no, in Swift, yeah, that about got that covers everything. Yeah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, so <laughs> right in, in in Java, you're gonna miss structures and, and value types. There, there's all kinds of things that you're going to miss in all kinds of languages. Um, it's all about the trade-offs. But then once you learn the basic programming concepts of one language, switching to another and learning its concepts, I gotta say, is pretty simple. So I don't mean learn Julia and that's it. You've you've hit your programming language quota. Um, I mean, you know, that that's just the beginning. Once you've learned Julia, that opens up the door to learning you know, tens of other languages much easier because now you know, you know, how to program. So I would say that's only uh, really the beginning. And as, as an extension to that, uh, thank you very much for asking the question, Akash. There's also another question from Tata Class Edge on YouTube. Uh, he's asking, or they're asking, when will AI-based cars be on the road? And, uh, Soon? I don't know. Uh, I can't break NDA. No, I'm Technically, um, <laughs> more NDAs. I no, mean, if you want to count Tesla, I don't know if you want to count That's what Tesla. I was about to say, though. Their full self-driving is in kind of open beta. It's not really rolled out. 
to well, rolled out, get it to everybody <laughs> yet. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but I um, mean, but they have. Um, I mean, I don't know the full capabilities of it. In if you were to buy a Tesla today, um, but I, I, you know, I do know that like if you have to, if you set a waypoint in the car waypoint what am i saying if you use your gps to, to to go somewhere with the car if it takes the highway then the car no, could actually just nowadays it does roads and everything completely automatically oh well there you go so yeah. like if you said if you set it to navigate somewhere it can kind of just go there yeah, yeah. my understanding is a lot of the technology not just with teslas to give them all the praise but other companies like mercedes and pretty much everyone else is coming out with electric cars that they want to fit ai into is a lot of it does come down to regulations um it's funny enough, Elon Musk was talking about that one time. He said it's very difficult to change the car, basically, mm -hmm. to innovate the car, because there are so many regulations that are in place that you have to have for a car. Incredible. If you, if you realize, like, all cars are standardized, if you think about it, that usually doesn't really tend to be the case with consumer products. You know, like, they're, they're going to try and make a phone that has two screens, you know, to get you to not buy, you know, the iPhone or whatever the case. And so, you know, there's always that, that crazy innovation. But with cars, you don't see that really tends to happen because, you know, like, the, the regulation says your side view mirror has to be this size and has to be able to show this much. And so many regulations with cars, um, even when it comes to the AI that can be used. I know there are some places that don't allow you to use, you know, self-driving cars to look at stoplights, for example, and, and tell you when to stop and go. They make you do that manually. So I guess the question sort of to add on to when do we get self-driving cars is, are we really there or almost there, but we're sort of just missing the regulation? Or do you still think there's a lot that we have to go through with the tech? That's such a good question because it's, 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 First of all, I don't work at Tesla, <laughs> so I don't know. But no, um, <laughs> uh, I, even though this would be a little bit more of speculation than it is actually, you know, I, I talked to Andrej yesterday and this is where he told me autopilot's at, no. Yeah. Um, so uh, even though this is a bit more speculation, I would say that from a technology perspective, we're a good 80% of the way there is, is, is my number. And the reason I say that is because all of the basic sort of data collection and machine learning model training is something that Tesla's worked on. They've got really good models that do this. Um, and I gotta say that whenever I work, I gotta say just generally even, um, as, as someone that works on software, and I feel like we, we discussed this even in our student special, someone that builds software, whenever I view advanced software in the wild, it almost is difficult for me to enjoy it because I get anxious as to how they would have implemented it. Like, what's the logic? How do they do that? <laughs> There's just so many examples like this. You know, I'll be watching a, a YouTube video of, you know, Tesla self, full self-driving or someone that implemented you know, a really interesting uh, machine learning use case. And I'll be like, you know, I, I won't be enjoying the fact that it works. I'll be there thinking, but why does it work? And how does it work? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of get distracted and almost not have fun. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and when it comes to Tesla full self-driving, you know, after I sort of overthought a lot about the interface of, of, of how exactly it works, it's, it's pretty clear the kinds of machine learning models they're using, right? They're using a combination of things like segmentation models and, and, and hard-coded rules alongside with, you know, uh, lane angle prediction and, you know, uh, object detection to be able to detect where bicycles and things are and they're using obviously the millions of miles of data that Tesla drivers have collected. So what I think um, the, the case is is that we've got all the basic technology there but the issue is that there are so many creative things that can happen on a road that it's just really weird right right there's this there's this one youtube channel i believe they have this thing called the can opener bridge i don't know what it is it's a bridge with a really low clearance and a lot of trucks will just sort of fly through there with a higher clearance and just kind of it'll rip their top off and there's yeah uh, there's 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 you know <laughs> millions of people subscribe to that youtube channel where they just keep uploading videos of trucks doing that <laughs> <laughs> when will they ever <laughs> learn <laughs> <laughs> they never do um, and so you know, if, imagine the truck in front of you does that. If there's a handful of bridges that actually do that in the entire of the United States, and your data was only from the entire United States, how's your car going to know how to deal with this brand new situation? Right? Roads aren't closed off to the public. A person could come walking onto the road and just do something unorthodox, and the self-driving car wouldn't know how to respond because that was never in the training data. So Absolutely. I would say the basic technology is there, but the fundamental idea of we're going to do full self-driving 
I don't think we're going to be completely there until we figure out some kind of way to standardize, at least in the majority of cases, what a road is going to look like, which I don't think is completely possible, but we're working on it. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of tricks that Tesla and other companies have got up their sleeves, so we'll have to wait and see what they do with their tech. Um, but we're on the right track. Absolutely. Um, I feel like it would almost be easier to implement self-driving cars if we sort of rolled it out at the same time we rolled out a smart city. I yes. feel like the biggest, I don't want to say problem, but the biggest thing to account for on the road is the fact that you're driving with people. People make mistakes. People, you know, as, as it goes, they say, you know, you know, driving is, is not just, you know, putting your gas on the pedal and going in a straight line. That's what it looks like to the observer, but the whole time you have to be focused on the road. And um, when you get around to, to taking your, your G2 test, uh, you will notice, like people will tell you to prep for your G2. It's like your instructor will be watching to make sure that you look at your mirrors literally every, like you have to make obvious head turns to your mirrors and to, to everything around you so that the instructor knows that you know that you have to be watching everybody on the road. Um, and, and that's something I think drivers can attest to is you have to be reactive to yeah. other people regardless of, of whether or not you're following the rules of the road. Um, and so because people are so unpredictable with what they can do um, and when they can start doing things, um, that's sort of the, the, you know, you're prone to accidents. But I think if every car is connected onto, let's say, the same network and every car can see what every other car is doing, um, obviously you still have to account for the, those can opener bridges. Uh, that's not English. Can opener bridges. There you go. Uh, if you still have to account for those, but, you know, assuming that sort of thing is out of the way, then all the cars can go one speed and stop signs and all that other um all the other fun stuff of the road. Um, One more thing, actually, yeah. um, uh, really quickly, I, I will say is is, is kind of like how you mentioned the um, uh, that, that point of how you know driving is sort of just sort of it comes to us naturally. It's not just you know putting you know your your, your foot on the pedal and, and sort of moving in a straight line. It's it's about the constant focus and micro adjustments and, and things that you do that you don't even realize you do. Um, you know, there, there are stories of people that will literally just kind of start driving and they'll sort of phase out and they'll just realize that they're home or they reached work and they'll be like, I drove the whole way there. <laughs> it sort of is, you know, second nature to a lot of people. And it kind of comes back to like, you know, the, the saying that walking is just controlled falling, right? Uh, <laughs> as you walk, you're not just walking, your body's making thousands of, you know, minuscule you know, muscular adjustments to make it so you continue to walk in a straight line and you don't fall over. Or even as I stand up right now, if I were to stand on, you know, one foot, I don't realize that I can do that, but, uh, well, you didn't see me do that, but I did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, you know, my body's making hundreds and thousands of adjustments every second to make it so I don't fall over. Um, and, and, and so these sorts of things we really take for granted because our subconscious nervous system is just like, yeah, we can we can handle that. We've evolved for millions of years to do that. No problem. No no sweat. But then you know we we try and code computers to do the same thing, and suddenly it all breaks down because they're not creative. <laughs> so um, I gotta say that's 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 definitely a limitation. Also, we've already covered this question, but we're also uh, getting another uh, similar question from Rock the World on the YouTube live stream right now, saying that he's 16, really looking forward to making his future in AI, but he doesn't have a lot of knowledge right now. Once again, I'm glad to say that I'm doing that launch of the Learn Deep Learning from Scratch series today on my YouTube channel with the first two tutorials. So please do make sure you take a look at those and stay tuned for the rest of the series as well. Subscribe, turn on notifications, you'll actually be notified when I release new videos in that series. Uh, and so yeah. I can't wait for you to take a look at Vishnu that. Vishnu just asked, uh, make a video on how to learn AI for beginners. So Oh, that's exactly go. what I'm doing, Vishnu. Stay tuned for today. Big launch <laughs> on, the, on the YouTube channel. and. Uh, Hopefully that helps out. Of course, any questions, feel free to put them in the live stream chat now or in YouTube receive. comments. Yep. <laughs> um, so there were some questions here, but they sort of started flooding in. Um, Navia asked, uh, once again, like best computer science college. Uh, anywhere you can get experience. Um, colleges are great to have, especially, you know, in different cultures across the entire world. Some people value college a lot more than others. Same with the university. But at the end of the day, experience trumps it. Um, so go to, you know, obviously do your best in school, go to the best school you can go to. But at the end of the day, someone who goes to a, a let's say, not as great school, but has much more experience than you has an upper hand um, in not just, you know, getting a job, but in the actual knowledge, because you do learn a lot more on the job. Uh, I've definitely learned a lot more on the job. 
um, than what they end up teaching in, in the schools. Um, so yeah, everyone just to, just to sort of dispel those questions, because I do sometimes tend to see a lot of them in this chat and other videos. Hopefully we can, you know, stop asking about like the best colleges and universities to go for, for programs. It's all about learning. You know, you have the internet, you have all these resources available to you, you know, focus on, on just knowing the material, you know, it, don't worry about what's the better school and whatever the case, because at the end of the day, why are you going to that school? You're going there so you can get a job, which is experience. Well, if the end goal is to get experience, focus on getting experience. Don't focus on, you know, like what is the best route so that in four years I can, you know, focus on getting that experience. There's online courses you can take. Not that you should, you know, not do school because you're doing online courses, but, you know, do online courses, study material, know the material, ace the interview, because that's one thing school doesn't teach you is how to ace the interview. Um, like the the little thing I've, I was talking to Tame about, um, I was saying, you know, we were going through a video where this guy was doing like a mock Google interview. Um, and I was telling him like the very first thing that it's sort of expected to do, like one of the, if you're a top interview candidate is when they give you the programming problem, you just ask questions immediately. And as soon as the guy finished at, uh, giving the problem, that's exactly what the guy did. And that's like, look, see, I told you, I told you. Um, just uh, there, there are sort of those, those things like, how to approach problems in an interview, how to make sure you're, you know, you're not stressed out and overcomp. I've done, I've overcomplicated problems on an interview and I've done it yeah. heavily. I'm almost embarrassed to say <laughs> the kind of simple questions I've been given on an interview. And I made such extensive code for when it could have very easily been done in like a single for loop with like two lines inside of it. Um, so focus on the material you love, focus on learning it, mastering it and doing well there. A lot of people keep asking, what's the best school? You know, it's going to put a paper on your wall and enough knowledge to be entry level. You want to, regardless of what school you go to, you want to also be learning and mastering the concepts as well. Um, so it's not just about what's happening in the classroom, but also outside the classroom. Um, we do have another question. This was from much earlier in the stream. Akash asked, why do you show some resistance slash opposition towards competitive programming? Uh, I, thank you for taking up that question because I, I, I wanted to answer that one. Uh, <laughs> um, here's the thing. Competitive programming in and of itself isn't a bad thing. It's, it's, it's great. It's a sport, right? It's, it's, it's great to have fun with. Right? It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the only issue that I have with it is that it doesn't translate well to real world problems and experiences. Right, like let's just say you were to go to Leap Code today, and if you were to solve the top five hard problems that barely anyone's able to solve, great. If you can do it in a short amount of time, even better. If you can get them to be fast, that's the best. But here's the thing: just because you can solve those five problems in specific that you have overfit your mind to be able to figure out how to solve, doesn't mean that you can then translate that to an arbitrary technology in an arbitrary field to solve an arbitrary problem. 99% of the time, computer science today is not about, you know, how can I invent the world's fastest sorting algorithm, or how can I take, you know, five linked lists and merge them into one sorted linked list, or how can I find, you know, the, the number of unique characters in a really long string for all substrings, right? 99% of the time, you're never going to be solving those problems in computer science, because there's a smarter guy that's already done it for you in a standard library. The rest of that 1%, sure, it'll be helpful for that. But the 99% of computer science is really about, here's a novel problem. I, like for example, again, goes back to Analyzer that I was working on IBM. The problem was, can we build compiler tooling to help DB2 developers test their code faster, their code changes faster? And you know that requires creativity. That requires almost like an art of, 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 of sort of programming knowledge to be able to say, all right, so now what we're gonna do is we are going to, uh, you know, we're going to create a shared library that we're going to link against every piece of DB2 source code and we're going to, you know, create a little LLVM pass that's going to insert a little block in the beginning of end of every function to insert an entry and an exit point to a buffer that is uh, flushed every three million iterations and we're going to store it on a four terabyte network drive because the logs, you know, it requires that creativity to put together that whole system. I wasn't sitting there thinking, hmm, what's the most efficient way for me to take a look at or, or sort all of the function hashes in my buffer? And I, I wasn't doing that. And that's what competitive programming teaches you how to do. So I would say that there's nothing wrong with competitive programming as a concept. It's fun, right? It is, 
Um, it is something that, that helps for logical thinking, sure. But when it comes to solving real world problems, don't expect it to necessarily translate. I feel like that's where experience comes in, solving actual problems, right? When, when we try and go back to that low level, sure, it's, it's, it's great, but that's not going to translate to high level problems that we actually end up solving in the computer science world. So um, it's not wrong. It's not bad. It's just people give it too much value for the wrong things, is, is, is what I would say. Which it's also funny. actually kind of, sorry, ties back into, yeah. you know, a, a way that I think, you know, for example, the way that we interview, you know, developers for, for getting job positions, I think that's also pretty fundamentally wrong. We try, yeah. and, <laughs> <laughs> we try and judge, you know, given this very specific problem, can you write something, you know, using these complex algorithms that the interviewer has never heard of, uh, and can you just, like, impress them? Like, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way, um, right? Like, like, for example, as a developer, I shouldn't need to care about making sure that my Swift code doesn't do copy on write so it's fast, right? So if I'm in an interview, I'm not going to sit there writing, you know, every, you know, line of C code so it's as fast as possible. I'm going to leave some stuff up to the compiler because in the real world as a developer, I'm never going to be doing what I did in that interview, right? I'm going to be saying I'm going to offload this task to the compiler because it helps me write code quicker and also helps me actually use the technology that's given to me. So. I mean, if I were an interviewer, then I would value that above pretty much anything else, is how well is your skill going to translate to real outcomes and real value? Um, so I would say that it's all about value, not necessarily about, yeah, I solved every hard lead code challenge, and I'm a great developer. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and that's sort of, that's the, sort of the, the same reason I had, and it's also part of the reason I'm so... Um, I don't want to say like anti-university, but you, you you guys notice that, um, you know, on the stream, even off the stream, when people ask me questions about school, I always lean on, you know, school is not the end, you know, it's not the way to do things because a lot of it is based on just throwing knowledge at you um, and, you know, just, oh, you know everything. But knowledge isn't the key. Um, the, you know, the truth is it doesn't really matter what you know in the sense that anything you don't know you can learn. Right. That's not the issue. And that's why I say experience is so important. Solving real world problems rather than getting a test question. You know, that's kind of like leak code. I do know there are some computer engineers who said our final exam was basically leak code. Um, <laughs> and so there the reason I'm so like I'm so you know adamant on like you need the experience, you need to do things outside of school and don't think of school as the way um, is because, you know, all it really does is throw that knowledge on you, which is absolutely great to have. Right. The more knowledge, the better but it doesn't teach you to be creative. When you think of all these people, you know, people love Nikola Tesla, they love Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, all these great physicists, um, even, even Isaac Newton. Um, these people weren't able to do what they were doing solely because they were smart and they knew so much and they went to school and blah, blah, blah. They were able to do what they're doing because they were so creative. A lot of people, for example, think the story goes with Isaac Newton that he was sitting under an apple tree and it fell on his head and all of a sudden he's like, oh, gravity, and started writing up his equations. No, that's not what happened. The true story, and yes, this is the true story, is he was sitting on an apple tree and he saw an apple fall and the wind pushed it to the side. So it's sort of like it fell to the side because of the wind. And he asked himself, is it possible for the wind to go so fast that the apple just falls indefinitely? It just keeps going to the side and it keeps going all the way to the side. It never hits the ground because it's always being pushed to the side, right? That creative thought process is what led him to say, okay, do my experiments, my mathematics and come, you know, and, and say, hey, we have gravity, right? Obviously he needed to know the math. He needed to, to know the physics or he created the physics at that point with the mechanical physics, but he needed to have that knowledge. Sure. But the creative thinking is what's the important part, because you can know how to solve every like, you know, like parse the substring and just like on leak code. That's great that you have that knowledge, but you need the creativity to be able to look at a problem and say, I need to know, you know, I know how to solve that. They say the most creative anybody can answer a question. It takes a real creative mind to say we need to question that question. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to look at that question and say, is this the right question we should be asking? Mm -hmm. Is this something, you know, is this answer the, the, the best way of doing things sort of thing? Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's the, the problem with, you know, competitive programming, not that it's inherently bad. It's a great sport, as Tammy has said. But, as, you know, as a, along the lines with everything, especially in tech, is if you want to be one of the better minds, you need to focus on being creative, not about how much you know. Because if I don't know something in programming, I have a lot of people I can just ask. 
yeah. right? A lot of times as a developer, it's like, oh, I'm typing something. How do you parse this object in Java again? Google it. Stack Overflow is free, Precisely. right? So it's not about what I know. It's about why did I decide to parse this? You know, mm -hmm. why am I deciding to use this method of, of approach to the problem? Because that creative thinking is what gets you to do the creative things that we have today. Precisely. I, 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 lo I love that specific example, actually. Um, and, you know, it goes back to, like, even if you take a look at the live coding series that I've done, you know, with, with, with Omer, there's still more to come in that series. Um, but, you know, if you take a look at some of the previous episodes, you'll notice that a lot of the times, you know, we'll be coding in Go, for example, and back then I didn't really know that much Go. I would be, you know, constantly Googling Stack Overflowing, how do you open a file in Go? You know, how can you use defers in Go? How do you, you know, launch a Go routine? It's simple things that you would expect a programmer to know on Googling, and that's what programming is like in the real world. You're never going to sit there knowing every line of syntax being your own human compiler, right? That, that's, that's not how it works. You are going to be Googling. You are going to be asking other people on Slack how to fix certain problems. That's just how it is. <laughs> so it's completely <laughs> unrealistic to try and interview people who have overfit to just being really good at doing a very specific task, which is, you know, nailing an interview. You know, you're, you're asking for the wrong thing, right? It's, it's, it's like training the reinforcement learning model um, to stay alive for as long as possible and break out versus actually clearing blocks, right? It's like, it would be like, why not just pause the game? <laughs> so, right, we're, 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 we're measuring against the wrong objective, and I feel like that's just completely wrong, right? So, like, um, Harish, uh, Harishika says, again, would it be wrong to say that being good at competitive programming translates to being a great software developer? I would say um, that it's, it's, there's correlation there, not causation. Just because you are great at competitive programming doesn't mean you are definitely going to be a great software developer. But usually the people who are great at competitive programming are great software developers, right? It doesn't necessarily, there's no causal link, but there's usually a correlation because you know, in, yeah, in, I would in say, some cases, there, there, there is a parallel. Yeah, I would say it's a good indicator, but it's not the factor you should be basing your decisions on. Agreed. Um, it's like math. There's different fields of math. If I come to you with a, a calculus question and you don't know how to answer it, it's not that you're bad at math. Maybe you just specialize in, in um, linear algebra, yeah. right? So that it's, it's just what it happens to be. Um, we do have a question from uh, not only in the chat, but also asked before the stream from Aditya, who says, hello, Tanme, I wanted a little help with personal project. I'm trying to develop a recommender system that will help to recommend financial products like mutual funds. I don't know where to start. Uh, how can I pursue developing this project? Is there any kind of guidance that you can give me for helping me make this project? Love the question, Aditya. Thank you for asking. Um, let's see. You mentioned a recommender system. Now the thing about, okay, so first of all, sorry, just before I answer your question, a little rant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like recommender systems today are really terrible. Like they're, they're just, I, I hate them. Uh, they're so inelegant. Because of the fact that all these systems out there today, like for collaborative filtering and, and even neural network based ones, they fundamentally depend on you having user vectors. So being able to say, these are all the users that I'm ever gonna need to recommend for, now help me recommend for them. That doesn't check out, that doesn't work, right? You need to be able to dynamically generate user vectors based off of past preferences. Um, and I feel like that's something that not enough people do. However, there are some frameworks that are easy to use and help you build these sorts of, you know, general purpose recommender systems that work across users. Um, one of them is called Turi Create. It's from, well, it wasn't, it's not, a, it's not initially from Apple, it's from, um, I believe, Graph Labs, um, and then Apple bought them out, but now it's an Apple package. It's Python, funny enough. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so, uh, well, Apple made a Swift wrapper called CreateML, but we don't talk about CreateML. Um, so, <laughs> so, so Turi Create is, is one package that I would recommend, first of all, um, is a great way to get started. But one thing that you didn't mention in your question is whether or not you already have the data sets to help you build the system. I would say that usually within recommendations, the, the issue is not building the actual system, it's usually collecting the data with which to recommend, right? So things like Spotify or Netflix, they've already got tons and tons and tons of data, uh, and so they are just pumping out recommendations like, like, like there's no tomorrow, right? Like, like Spotify, you, you play music, 
it won't stop. <laughs> it's just going to keep going <laughs> because it just knows what you want to listen to. And Apple Music only recently started to get that right. Um, and so I would say that, first of all, your challenge would be getting data. But if you do already have the data, then Turi Create is a great way to get started building your recommender systems. Apart from that, there are other things that you can do. Like, for example, this is my favorite, neural collaborative filtering, but a slightly modified version that doesn't use hard-coded user vectors. Um, and so I will be putting a couple of links later in the description. I'll actually go ahead and LinkedIn message you back as well, um, the, the specific resources. But unfortunately, since I'm not in the field of finance, I can't really recommend how to get the data sets in the first place. So hopefully you do have that figured out. If not, let me know what the challenges are, and I might be able to help you out. So hopefully that answers your question. I do also want to add, throw in a little bit of, um, make sure you understand the finance side of it as well. I mean, I'm, I'm going to assume that you do, um, but sometimes, you know, people are trying to make, um, I know, for example, when people, you know, just get started in AI, they like to show, <laughs> oh, here's our model that predicted stocks for like the next 10 <laughs> I days. Knew we were gonna that's say a that. very, I knew you were going to say yep, that. Yep. <laughs> it's a very, very, very popular thing for people to do is like, oh, look, here's the stock market. And then here's our AI model on the same graph. You see, it's basically accurate. Um, so but, actually, hold up, hold up, pause. Yeah. I'll let you continue your thought. Remember what you want to say. But um, the thing is about that, I, I really hate that example because <laughs> what, <laughs> what happens is, this is really funny, <laughs> when you train the model on continuous sequences like this, if you look at the weights, the model just learns to copy the past two days of data the next two days. <laughs> So it's literally just offsetting the graph by like two days. <laughs> That's all it's doing. And it looks so accurate because when it's offset by just that much, you look at the graphs and they're pretty much the same. And you're yeah. like, wow, we can predict stock prices now. Great. <laughs> but all it's doing is it's taking previous data points and just pasting them Moving over it. in a window. <laughs> so, uh, and and like stocks, example. for example, stocks, for example, um, it's a great example to me on why it's very difficult to to do the, the finance part with, with AI, uh, especially because a lot of people doing it don't really know the finance. Uh, a perfect example is with Apple with the iPhone 12, because now I have some stocks invested. And so I, I look at the market every now and then, and Apple announces the iPhone 12, 12 mini, 12 pro, 12 pro max, you know, great devices, amazing cameras, Apple's um, raw video format, incredible, incredible event. They announce iPads, Apple watch, everything, right? What do you expect to happen to the Apple stock on that day? What happens every year? The stock goes up, right? That's pretty normal. You can look at the trend, the stock goes up. But actually the stock went for Apple went down and it's actually been going down for a couple of days now. And you know, some, someone who makes an AI model to, you know, and trains it on this data that we have all the previous years. So every time in September, Apple's stock spikes or it spikes, it's going to get it wrong because it actually, you know, there's no way to to account for the fact that the thing that usually happens and brings it up actually makes it plummet. Um, and then, you know, it, it's based on factors like um, what are their quarterly earnings? You know, Apple reported that they made 60 billion in revenue and 11 billion in profit. They announced that in, in, in April for the quarter and, you know, their stock prices go up. But other, you know, maybe one year Apple doesn't do so well, or sometimes things do really well, but it doesn't do well enough. For example, for those of you who play video games, Call of Duty, um, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, when that came out, I believe last year, or two years ago, sorry, when Black Ops 4 came out, it sold like 500 million copies in the first week. Um, and that's very impressive, especially for Call of Duty games. But the investors, the stakeholders, they were expecting more. So even though it was such an incredible sale, it actually was a disappointment. So these sort of things, there's so many factors to, to measure when you're predicting things and saying, okay, you should invest in this and, and do that. Even with, even with mutual funds, there's so many factors to look into. So I would say, yes, while you're looking at the technology, you're looking at where do I get my data set? Uh, you know, what's the best way to approach it? You also wanna make sure you're understanding the finance aspect of that because your knowledge of the finance also has to be incorporated into your model. The factors that can affect, uh, I don't know if you can account for every single factor, but you know, if you know certain things don't really change the, the value of the mutual fund that much, or certain <laughs> things do, these are the things you want to account for in your model, right? So uh, I, that's why I feel I just need to get that out there. When I see people, especially with finance, try yeah. to do things with machine learning, you need to know that stuff as well. 
uh, it's very easy to apply machine learning in a lot of other places because it's usually just applying it in tech, yeah. right? So obviously, if you're doing machine learning, you know the tech. But if I step out and say, I'm going to make a model that makes objectively the greatest art ever. Art <laughs> is subjective, but this is just going to be everyone who looks at it is wowed. You're going to need to have an understanding of art, the mm -hmm. history of art, right? And modern art and all these other types of things, you have to know it. You can't just mm -hmm. only be a tech guy and expect to create this amazing AI that just makes objectively great art. <laughs> <laughs> Love the example, um, and uh, you know I I gotta say in specific uh, with with Aditya, uh, luckily he does work at a Bain Capital company, um, uh, and he's go. data engineer there. So so I mean, but you brought up an amazing point, Michael, and that is that within machine learning, it's always good to be working with domain experts because. Machine learning is fundamentally about personalizing technology and making it as close to the industry that it's in as possible, right? That's, that's, that's literally what it's about. And so if you're not working with domain experts, if you're not working with the people who know their stuff within that specific field, I feel like you're not going to have a successful machine learning application. So that is definitely a, a sort of precondition. Um, and I think Aditya is definitely qualified, but uh, um, uh, hopefully, though, uh, that, was, uh, that was that was that that was helpful. So again, if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the live stream chat uh, around that. But yeah, good point, Michael. Yeah. And uh, uh, to steer away from the technology for a bit, uh, we have a very fun question that I got again from very early on in the stream. Um, the world is waiting to know, and including I, what is your schedule like? What is your ideal schedule? What happens when Tammy <laughs> wakes up in the morning? Does he wake up surrounded by a bed of computers? <laughs> Does he only. remove his charger and he's ready to go? <laughs> no, I he just plug in overnight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, my schedule is pretty normal. Uh, <laughs> despite what it might seem like, my, my schedule isn't that um, weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Michael, you can probably attest to that. Well, maybe you can't, but um, <laughs> no, but <laughs> really though, um, I mean, my schedule is pretty normal. I mean, you know, I, as you mentioned, I'll, I'll usually wake up, not usually in a bed of computers, just a normal bed, as crazy it might seem. Um, and <laughs> I mean, usually the first thing that I'll do is, of course, check my phone, but that doesn't mean I plug myself in overnight. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll usually, you know, wake up and... Um, you know, eat, eat, eat breakfast or do whatever I usually do in the morning. I mean, it's kind of weird because whatever I do is so normal that I'm like, is this something that I want to mention? See, right but now it's, or? but it, it, it's kind of not because like you being 17, like you should be in, in school technically. Right. So You're it's like, right. so that actually brings me to like, you know, throughout the day, what I do actually kind of depends on a variety of things. Right. So it depends on what am I doing the next day? What are the things that I've committed to doing? What meetings do I have that day? What do I still need to learn? Like, like I'm homeschooled, for example. There are things that I still do learn from school. You know, <laughs> believe it or not, I do. Apart from technology, <laughs> learn other things. Um, so, you know, it, it depends on a bunch of different factors. Like, for example, yesterday was, you know, preparing for today's live stream, making it so we can actually answer people's questions, uh, getting all the tech in place and everything. So a lot of my time yesterday went into making sure that everything's set up for today. Um, whereas a lot of my work, or sort of a lot of my time a couple days ago would have gone into actually building code because there were a couple of projects that I'm working on that are due soon, so I would be writing code for them. Um, but you know, every, every day, you know, my schedule will consist of first of all a lot of code, regardless of <laughs> what I'm doing. You know, it could be for you know an actual project, it could be just I want to code for fun, it could be anything. A lot of my day is code. A lot of my day is um, you know uh, working with technology more generally, things like you know writing books and recording YouTube videos and editing YouTube videos, especially with this new AI series that I'm so excited about. A lot of the time fast few days have gone into um you know preparing the series to get it as um as as sort of ready as possible for everybody to uh to sort of have fun with and learn from so uh, and then of course apart from that there's also things like biking and table tennis that i really enjoy I haven't been able to do much biking during COVID stuff but i did do some gardening that i talked about in the teaser video for this uh, episode so uh grew some tomatoes but we planted them too late because i was really busy during the summer uh and we had to pick them way too early as well because it's <laughs> cold outside now. <laughs> but, um, Winter is coming. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, those are the sorts of things that I just do on a, on a normal day. Um, it's, 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 I would say relatively normal, but then again, it, to me, it feels normal because that's just what I do. To everybody else, it might be weird. I don't know. Um, but I would say that I really enjoy my daily schedule. Um, you know, sometimes I'll... 
you know, as as it's you funny. probably know, as as you probably know better than anyone, Michael, you know, make some craft dinner or 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 oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> a grilled cheese or something. I don't know, um, but <laughs> just normal. We stuff. need to have a uh, we need to have a showdown on who makes the best craft dinner. Absolutely, definitely. Maybe, um, but, uh, but, not really. Yeah, okay, um, <laughs> farmer boy. No, um, it, it's funny that you you mentioned the tomatoes because I do I still do remember making a joke that you know one day there's the AI uprising and, and developers go into hiding. And then just some far, far away land in the plains of rice, there is a farmer who's just tending to his rice plants. And someone asked him, "Is like, are you Tanmay Bakshi? He says, Tanmay. I haven't heard that name in a very long time. So it's, it's very great that you're actually starting now. Um, so if anyone is wondering whether or not AI will take over, there's your answer. He's already learning to grow the tomatoes. No. Uh, <laughs> so on the topic, though, of your daily routine, uh, as someone who spends a lot of time with their code, I can imagine this can be um, very broad depending on what you're working on, but what are some of the technology tools that you use on a regular basis or a daily basis? Some of the technology tools I use on a daily basis. Hmm. Well, see, uh, it, it's kind of hard for me to answer that because I do all kinds of things with technology. Um, <laughs> I would say my main tools that I happen to use like every day, of course, some kind of web browser, obviously, right? Um, <clears throat> Apollo, the Reddit client, definitely. <laughs> um, <laughs> Xcode, for sure. Um, I'm on a Mac, so, of course. Um, what a part, what a part from that. Of course, Swift compiler, Keynote. I guess. Yeah, Keynote, Keynote, for sure. Actually, <laughs> also recently, Manon, Manon, that, yes. uh, the animation library from 3 Blue one brown that we've been, uh, taking a look at. So, um, that, that's, uh, that's definitely been really interesting. It's, it's a great library. There's just a lot to it, and there's no documentation. So <laughs> <there's>, <laughs> that, that's that's one thing. IBM Cloud I do use pretty much daily. Um, <laughs> sometimes I'll use a couple services like Google and and, and Microsoft Cloud as well. But uh, those are uh, usually a little bit less often. Um, so I, I feel like it really just depends on the on the day. You know what it is that I'm working on, what it is that I'm doing. But in general, I guess. You know, a web browser, you've got Xcode, you've got Clang and LLVM tools installed. You're, you're, I'm pretty much good to go. That's all I need. <laughs> Vim, Vim for sure, though. I, yes. I, will, I will die on that hill. Um, that, that is the, the greatest command line text editor. You know, Emacs and Nano don't come close. So <laughs> that's... Uh... Um, Sahil in the oh, chat actually, said... one more yeah, thing. Go. Nimbix Cloud. Nimbix Cloud oh, yes. is, is incredible. They... Uh, uh, they have a lot of different compute power, and they work on like you know with NVIDIA DGX machines and power machines and all these things that are um, that are pretty pretty incredible. The fact that they can have a single cloud environment that works across all those architectures, even FPGAs, I find that just fascinating. So Nimbix as well. Go ahead. But yeah, I I love how you're naming all the technologies. You're slowly trying to get me to, to become <laughs> uh, proficient, and I see what your plan is now. But um. <laughs> We have Sahil in the chat. He said Tanmay is just Thanos, like the farmer, and it's 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 just really funny to me. You know, like we have our AI uprising, and then Tanmay just snaps his fingers, and all the AI robots die. He's like, I use the AI to destroy the AI. No, the worst um, friends, they don't get the rep. They don't get the, rep. <laughs> the chat understands. Tanmay used the AI right, to destroy the AI. Um, but uh, so on the 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 topic of you know, you traveling to a faraway land when the AI take over, <laughs> wink, wink. Um, in terms of places you've gone, you know, throughout the past couple of years, you have traveled quite a bit, uh, doing different keynotes all over the world. You've been to Germany, and I can't think of anything else off my head. Um, but you've been to all these different places. So what would you say is your favorite trip that you've been on, the favorite place you've been to, or just favorite trip in general? There would be two. One, because of the chaos. The other, because of just it was fun, right? <laughs> um, you, if you if you've watched Tech Lives Goes for some time uh, uh, from from the chat, then you you probably know this one. Uh, one of my favorites is definitely Arkansas, um, and so Arkansas would definitely be on, on high on the list, especially because just the experiences there, right? The people are are, are amazing. The um, you know the the 
uh, the technology that I got to saw there, get, got to see there was was great. You know, you would think Arkansas. Why would you see amazing technology in Arkansas, of all places? But <laughs> you know, I got to see a lot of the different stuff that Walmart's working on. And I got to say, my conception went from being, you know, Walmart's where we go when my parents want to do groceries and I want to get McDonald's to Walmart is the tech company. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, you know, I I love that trip for sure. Another one that was incredibly chaotic but also incredibly fun was one where I had to um, do a couple different keynotes um, in, in Germany, India, the Bahamas, and Australia. And that was in one trip in a single week. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> jet <so>. lag. <laughs> Yeah, my, my my circadian rhythm didn't exist. That was a null point or exception. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was that was one thing. Um, it was it was really fun in 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 the Bahamas, um, especially because when we got there, I had actually lost a bag and I had to fly to Australia the next day with that bag. But the thing Ooh. is, we also happened to land on the wrong island because we forgot which one the <laughs> keynote was on. So we had to take a last minute flight to that other island. It was, it was a whole thing. Um, but but it was the fun. The station starts in 30 minutes. 10 is still <laughs> on the plane. No, I actually unfortunately missed one of the keynotes in the Bahamas. There were two, so I got to do the second. Anyway, that's a um, whole thing. Um, <laughs> but, but the Bahamas was a really fun trip for sure, uh, even though it was very quick, <laughs> um, as well as, uh, I mean, as, as I mentioned, Australia. Australia, Gold Coast, uh, that was also pretty incredible. Uh, again, great people there. It was for uh, KPMG, so that was that was great. And also, Dubai is a pretty nice place as well. You know, I've had some 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 of the best Indian food I've had is in Dubai. So I I, I would say that's uh, that's great. And also, safely saying that uh, I I wish for you to have a trip in the Philippines. I would love that. Hopefully, when this COVID stuff sort of dies down a bit, I can I can finally travel to the Philippines and do a keynote there too. I would love that. Yeah, that's pretty cool, especially because the, the person who did the art for the secret project I'm working on, actually, I've talked about it on the last time, the book I'm writing. I, <laughs> I mentioned on the last time, the person who did the art for that is actually also based in the Philippines. Um, and for some reason, my AirPod just disconnected. That's fun. Um, <laughs> Technology. See, te alrighty. technical difficulties is our, our, our I can't hear anything right now. This is a classic. No worries. No worries. Um, it's fine. <laughs> I'm just yeah. going to use my ears for now. Um, <laughs> yeah, technical difficulties are... Uh... They're, uh, but, they're interesting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there's still so many places. Like, I mean, I've gone to, you know, like Florida, Cuba, um, and, and those areas. And it's always, I, I've always just kind of liked the beach scene. You know, both my parents are Caribbean um, from Dominica. And, you know, so I'm very, they have the big open seas and stuff because it's a small island. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always just liked anywhere that's warm with a beach. That's, mm -hmm. That works for me. That's all I need. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we have another question from Sunny. Sunny is asking um, why IBM cloud services are on top. And seeing as though you are the developer advocate at IBM, <laughs> here's your chance to advocate for IBM. Tell us why IBM cloud services are on top. If you insist. All right. Um, <laughs> um, well, actually, first of all, I'm going to answer your question, but there's another question that is... Uh, that I have a very passionate opinion about. You'll probably see it in the live stream chat, Michael, and you'll 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 recognize it instantly. Um, but let me answer this <laughs> question first. Um, so, the thing about um, about IBM Cloud, it's not that IBM Cloud in particular has you know specific features that other clouds don't. It's that the the kind of use cases that I run in specific happen to work best on the IBM Cloud. Right now, if you take a look at, at IBM Cloud, it's not really just cloud, right? It's not just like Google Cloud or Azure or AWS. Uh, IBM Cloud is more than just that. It's about the services that they provide for hybrid cloud, right? So being able to say, all right, I love this IBM service, but my application simply won't work on IBM Cloud. What do I do? Well, I'm going to take IBM. Um, they, they've got, you know, OpenShift, Red Hat OpenShift. I'm going to be taking, you know, Cloud Pack for data. I'm going to take that. I'm going to run it on Azure or I'm going to run it on Google Cloud Platform. Um, and, and that's what really is so powerful about IBM Cloud is that even if I as a developer, I'm like, Hmm, I could get a machine with eight 32 gigabyte, you know, V100s or even 16 A100s on Google Cloud, but then I would miss out on Watson Studio Auto AI. Well, I don't have that predicament anymore because I can go to IBM and say, hey, I want, you know, Watson Studio and I want to be able to put that on uh, a Google Cloud server and suddenly just like that, natively supported, works well because thanks for that OpenShift. So 
What's powerful to me about IBM Cloud is that portability aspect, is that the hybrid cloud angle sort of works so well. Um, that's, that's in specific one of the reasons that I, that I prefer working with, with that cloud environment so much. Um, but uh, we, will, we will cover more cloud in, 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 in the future for sure. Now, uh, Michael, did you recognize the question? Oh, sorry, my mic was muted. Uh, I, I, I believe so. I definitely have. I am 99.9% .9 sure I found it. I'm going to say it is from Mohammed who asks, what is the, uh, he says, sorry, that the best example of technology nowadays is Sophia the robot. You and read I my mind, I Michael. I wonder how. <laughs> <laughs> You're a mind reader, Michael. Okay, so uh, first of all, Mohammed, thank you for for um, bringing up that topic because I have very very specific opinions on these sorts of technologies that I that I want to sort of get across, and that is that artificial intelligence technology, first of all, ignoring Sophia the robot altogether and all these other humanoid robots, is incredibly misrepresented and misunderstood. Artificial intelligence is the kind of technology that w that is incredibly capable first of all right like we've got machine learning technology we've got all these different things that are that are great right we, again face id active noise cancellation on my sony headphones you know zoom background removal you know noise removal from the audio all this is powered by machine learning but still we don't understand as as a society not as developers i think as a society what ai is capable of and it even comes down to the naming Right, uh, going back to that sort of like linguistic psychology stuff that I'm interested in, the fact that we even call it artificial intelligence is really telling because subconsciously it's really, really difficult for us to think of AI as anything other than intelligent. You know, even I, as you know, the biggest advocate for AI isn't really intelligent. Even I will look at a Google Home and subconsciously I'll be like, but there has to be some kind of intelligence, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? And I'll be like, when I speak, there has to be some kind of understanding or reasoning or perception of that audio. But then I consciously go back and tell myself, no, bad Tammy, no, that's not how it works. <laughs> right? So, bad Tammy. Go read your Julia book. <laughs> <laughs> go write your Julia book. No. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I completely understand why this is a misconception. Even I, you know, am, am, am definitely um, victim to it. And it's simply because subconsciously we as humans have recognized that anything that we interact with for literally millions of years, anything that we interact with through like, you know, talking in natural language or images or things like this, that other thing has been sentient. It's been conscious. It's been living, right? And so now, all of a sudden, when we've transitioned to technology that can also understand and synthesize language, our subconscious minds are going like, yeah, well, obviously there's some kind of intelligence going on in there, right? It's like, why do people not you know, want to have sensitive conversations when their Google Home is listening? Or say Apple HomePod. It's not like Apple's taking your recordings even if you said no and uploading them to iCloud. It's not because a human's listening. It's because your mind is like, that thing understands my language. It's intelligent. It's going to know. It's going to judge me, right? You know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's weird the way that we represent AI. And the thing is, I feel like that's a problem that we need to solve. It's not, um, it's not just an inert thing. Sure, we misunderstand it. It's actively harmful because then people that are responsible for making decisions don't make the right decisions. Um, and, and so I feel like examples like, you know, Sophia the Robot or Erica from Japan and all these different um, examples, they're very misleading in the sense that they almost advertise, you know, this is intelligence. This is, you know, a, an artificial human, whereas it's usually just human written responses to interview questions or, you know, very simple Google Cloud, you know, text to speech. Now, I will say the, the, the technology is incredibly complex. I commend the teams that actually built it. Right. There's incredible hardware engineering going on there. There's amazing deep learning for motion recognition and even emotion synthesis. Uh, right to be able to take uh, text and automatically determine the emotions and use that to, uh, you know, shape the, the face. There's incredible technology, but I don't want us misrepresenting that as intelligence because that's just completely false. So I feel like these are great examples of technology, but take it with a, a spoonful of salt. <laughs> is, is is what I'll say. So yeah, it's um, even I even I, I fall victim to it. <laughs> Yeah, but I remember watching a video uh, maybe like a year or two ago or so, uh, just a couple of years ago on um, 
I, I can't remember what it's called, but it's uh, if someone might recognize this as YouTube channel, like pretends to be an AI and they just make a video on like the history of like humanity or some weird topic. Um, and they're talking about um, how like, oh, scientists think in like 2050, there will be this sentient AI that's going to take over <laughs> humanity and all that is posing all these philosophical questions. Like if you don't work to help build the AI now, then the AI will like, judge you. So you can technically be doing everything you can to build it. But then if you do build it, you build it sooner. And and so there's all, all these philosophical questions, but AI doesn't really work like that. Um, so it, it, it's it's kind of funny because I had recently rewatched that video. And I remember the first time it came around, I was like, wow, this is such a thought provoking concept. And now I'm watching it. I'm like, yeah, I can barely sit through this. This is just so I know. wrong. I, I actually so got to say, similar to my anxiety when I see complex technical solutions, you know, I'll be watching just a TV show, you know, lighthearted TV show. It's just for fun. And they'll talk about like AI, you know, being sentient and there's this AI on the computers and it's, you know, it's on the internet. It's like, you know, it's, 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 and I'm like, I can't watch this. <laughs> it's just, it is so it's, wrong. <laughs> it's actively annoying to watch. <laughs> yeah. Um, you so, go on YouTube, you search the, the greatest uh, hacker scene in, in TV. That's a funny one. They're trying to slow us down. Pictures of cats showing up on the screen. <laughs> oh my God. That's... Um, yeah, so that, that's the, that's the, uh, the cool thing about uh, actually working with AI and, and knowing what it does is that you don't really have these concerns that a lot of people outside the sphere uh, tend to have about what it can do. You know, people watch the Terminator and they think, oh, we can't invest in AI because that's what's going to come down to. But that's, it's really not the case. Um, we have another question from Outmash. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, who says that the, the Synac Red team is working on AI Hydra tool that uses artificial intelligence for presenting apps. Pen Do you testing. think AI can replace human presenters? Pen testing, not presenters. Oh, oh, my thing is really small. Well, pen testing then. <laughs> so I was saying, cause I was gonna say, wow, it's a very interesting human. I, I'm like, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> well, now testing, that you mentioned yeah. it, we'll cover both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my so, monitor is 4K, so I'm like literally squinting to read these, so. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's kind of weird. Cause like I, I, my camera's up here, so I'm looking at you now. But then my YouTube comments are down here, so it looks like I'm you know, in a different <laughs> world right now. But I'm actually, you know, I want to look at you, but I also got to look at, you know, the guy's question. All right, I got the so. three monitors set up. I'm turning my neck. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm moving up and down. Anyway, so, <laughs> so uh, first of all, for pen testing, no, I don't. First of all, just to make it simple, right off the bat, no, it's not going to replace pen testers. Um, will it help pen testers? Will pen testers be able to do their job more effectively? Will they be able to do it quicker with AI? Definitely. We've already got two major applications that do this. IBM Research is CLI, I believe it's called, C-L-A-I, Command Line AI, as well as OpenAI's GPT-3 version, which is similar to what uh, IBM Research did. Um, both of these applications are already incredibly helpful for any developer. I believe everybody should just have these installed, right? Being able to give natural language of the commands that you want to run and automatically translate them into commands, like untar the file that I just downloaded and move it to another folder, right? These, these sorts of things, I feel like we should just be using them right now anyway. Um, so it will definitely help pen testers. And the reason that I won't say it won't replace them is because again, pen testing is such a creative job. I don't even specialize in cybersecurity, and already I can think of millions of reasons of why exactly AI wouldn't be able to do what humans do. And I'm sure that if you were to ask someone who actually specializes in cybersecurity, uh, that you know they'd be able to tell you even more. But in in general, if you think about the way that we architect security systems, it's it's very creative the ways that hackers will try and you know um, in, intrude within those systems. I feel like one of my favorite examples um, is, and I'm not even sure if I'm recounting this correctly. It's just so convoluted. Looted, right like on the iPhones um, there is the there's a very there's a very specific boot process and there's a buffer of memory um, that I believe is either freed too early but then is still used in the operating system so it's a software bug or it's not freed early enough either one of those two um, and what uh, what the hackers can do is they can actually take the leftover bytes in that buffer and they can actually insert custom code there because it's been freed uh, and they can get the operating system to execute that code and it's like how do you even figure that out <laughs> it's like of the millions of instructions that you're combing through how do you figure out that that buffer stored in that register and that function <laughs> happens to be the one where you're like ai is not going to do that for you <laughs> so uh, i i gotta say that um it, it's definitely going to help 
but it's not going to replace pen testers. I feel yeah. like, uh, go ahead. I was going to say a perfect example that also I was thinking of an example with the iPhones um, was, was jailbreaking. I remember back yes. in like 2009 uh, when I had an iPod touch, jailbreaking was as simple as just plugging your phone or your iPod into your computer, clicking a button and it would do the work. The website. Oh yeah. Oh, and they, they had like, oh, that was the funniest one to me because it was literally on a website. Usually yeah. you had to like download black. I thought Rain it was a and, scam back then. I was like, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time it came around, it was like black rain with a one instead of an I. Yeah. Then with iOS four, it was like lime rain. And, and so like, it was always getting, you know, you know, trickier, especially because every year uh, Apple was including more and more jailbreak patches. Yeah. Uh, and not even every year, it's literally every single software update, they had to yeah. create a new jailbreak. Um, and I remember sort of nearing the jailbreaking is essentially dead to my knowledge. It's not something people do as often or that many people are trying to do because Apple has just been patching it over the years. But so near that quote unquote end of the life uh, for jailbreaking, I remember there was a jailbreak where, you know, would run through all this code and then you had to go on your phone and it would pop up and it would say like the name of the jailbreak, whatever it's called, would like to access photos. And I'm sitting there thinking, how complex <laughs> like, what, is the, what is how did you go into the system like what are you doing that you need to access my photos because you know jailbreak changes the entire like os you know what yeah. i mean like it, it's going into the root of the system i'm like what are you doing in the photos that you need that you There's need to some access? kind of exploit in the photo system exactly right so <laughs> that that's what i'm saying with uh and i that's i completely agree with you that it can't really replace uh, pen testers um just because those are the certain things that you know you can't really train a model to just pick up on um in that sense you're always going to need that human element to say hey by the way we have this exploit because it was really weird if i remember when i was reading on it i think they had to like go through contacts first and yeah. exploit something in contacts and then go back <laughs> and then photos would let you so it's like it's very very convoluted in the sense that you really do need an individual's eyes to look at it and say hey wait a minute here's an idea yeah um, so, and, and especially now with like the secure enclave and everything it's like <laughs> uh, it's just getting more and more complex yeah ai is not going to help us here uh well it'll help us but it's not going to replace us here but yeah. um also uh, yeah maybe we want to take up the question from guna now yeah absolutely uh you can ask because uh, i see yeah it. um so Guna asked, uh, the virtual analyst tool is currently being used by many popular software companies around the world. So my company owns a virtual analyst tool, which is powered by NLG, NLP, ML, DL, and cloud. Can you mention some tips to take this tool to the next level? Okay, so I'm going to expand those acronyms first. Natural language <laughs> generation, natural language processing, machine learning, deep learning, and cloud. Cloud is an acronym. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so first of all, that sounds like a really interesting tool. Um, now the thing is in order for me to give you more tips, I would say that I would need to see the tool, right? I feel like this comes back to what we were talking about. Machine learning is all about domain expertise. There's no such thing as just, yeah, here's machine learning, go put it in your app. Um, it's, it's all about how does it integrate with the rest of my application? What is it going to do? What is it, what will it let users do? You know, why does it work? Why does it need to be machine learning? In a lot of the cases I'm going to say, I've had so many projects where people are like, let's use AI. And then I'm like, <laughs> No, take a step back. <laughs> we can easily do this with a couple of if statements. <laughs> so um, I'm not saying that that's what you would need to do in your tool, not at all. Like I'm sure that machine learning would be helpful for you. Um, but I would need to take a look at the actual tool itself. Um, and, and of course, you know what exactly that virtual analyst um, sort of accomplishes in the first place, I would say. In general, I would say, if I were to sort of abstract away from your question a little bit and say more generally for any field, uh, my advice for any field would be look at where the bottlenecks are in your process, right? What are the parts of that process that are inefficient where collect or, or, or apart from that, you're collecting a lot of data, but you're not using it. When you see those two things, that's usually where machine learning technology can help you. Um, so don't think of it from like an AI first perspective, like, hey, how can you know machine learning help us do this? But rather say, what are the problems? And if machine learning happens to be a relevant solution for the problem, then great, apply it. Um, and machine learning helps us solve all kinds of problems that we couldn't before. So I, I'm sure that any pipeline um, would, would, would sort of help uh, sort of uh, support that. Uh, Guna asks, has sort of added to his question saying uh, his analyst tool search, uh, sorry, sorry, 
acts like a search engine. Um, and so what that implies to me is it's that it's, it's, it's almost like a Watson Discovery-like tool or an IBM Retrieve and Rank type tool uh, where you have you know a bunch of documents about a bunch of domain knowledge that you've ingested and you want to be able to use natural language to query across them. Um, there's a lot of what I would say uh, fun and interesting applications that individual researchers have worked on within that area of information retrieval that haven't necessarily made their way into production just because it's too complex and there's no like centralized um, company that's working on it. Um, Watson already has a lot of these technologies, but some of them that I think need more attention would be, for example, um, the um, DQA system, for example, that went behind Watson playing Jeopardy, all the different scores and how they work towards scoring evidence. Um, and, uh, you know, IBM has a couple, I'm not sure if they're out yet, so I can't exactly talk about them, but IBM's working on some couple, a couple of different projects that are sort of um, related in, in a sense to that technology and they're coming out soon. Um, but uh, I would say that, again, until I see what your capabilities already are and what you're already doing with the application, I can't really recommend because I could easily say, you know, integrate say a squad QA system uh, with your uh, with with your with your application uh, to make it so you can automatically extract exact answers from your documents, but you may already be doing that because you mentioned NLG, so I don't exactly know yet. Um, but but it's it's interesting that you brought that up. Feel free to reach out to me um, over over LinkedIn or or email after the show. Uh, there the contact is in the description, uh, and I can sort of help you out more more personally if I find out more about your problem. So. Uh, th but thanks for asking, and, and I would love to help. It's just that I need to know a little bit more about the app first. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, especially when there's such a heavy combination of different AI technologies, yeah. uh, you really do need to understand how they're working together. Because uh, I don't imagine just one tool. Click here for deep learning. Yeah, like what is this? <laughs> what is it? What does that mean? <laughs> All right. So. Um, De definitely when, when things are intertwined like that, uh, absolutely you need a deeper look. Um, and he says, yeah, he'll, he'll reach out to you. So thank you Wonderful. for that. Um, I, I, I think we already talked about cloud computing, um, if I remember we correctly. Have. We have talked okay. a bit about cloud. Um, we, we might cover more cloud in, in another episode. I'll say just for now really quickly though, is yeah. that cloud computing is, is, is really fun. Um, it's 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 a great technology from a developer's perspective. You know, I love cloud because now I can be agile. If I were to put that buzzword in there, um, but um, really, what the cloud enables me as a developer to do is have flexibility. Is to say, you know, I you know yesterday I wanted eight v one hundreds, now I want sixteen a one hundreds, and suddenly I'm just like Google shut down my v other VM, turn on a new one, and just like that, I've got new machines. Right? That 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 flexibility as a developer is my Actually, really quickly, I'm, I'm going to say, back when I was like 12 to 14, that age range, I didn't really think much of cloud computing. Um, and the reason for it was because when I got into technology, like, I, I, I was young enough to just always be using technology in a cloud computing era. I didn't <laughs> know what it was like before that. <laughs> and so and so i just took it for granted i was like yeah obviously you can just spin off the vm and then you know spin up another a100 um but then only recently did i start to realize you couldn't do that before <laughs> and so you know i i was i've been i've been young enough and lucky enough actually to just be working with technology in the era of cloud computing so i'm I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, I'm cloud native. Great pun. Um, <laughs> um, so, I, I I'll say that <laughs> I I, I kind of took it for granted. But um, it is it is really interesting technology, um, which can be applied to all kinds of um, all kinds of different use cases. Uh, but I got to say that there, there are new things that we can focus on, even though cloud computing is something that has been incredibly innovative and continues to be. I feel like it's not that sort of, you know, primary focus of everybody right now. That's like, you know, it's in its stage of it's mature, it's doing iterative um, sort of um, upgrades. And I say iterative relatively too, because like, you know, every, every major upgrade, you know, from new virtual machine types to new Docker, oh, sorry, containerization, uh, we're so used to thinking of Dockers as the only way to containerize that I said Dockerization. I, I meant containerization, <laughs> uh, new containerization technologies, these sorts of things. It is great, but you know that's not the forefront of emerging technology so far, uh, or sorry, today. So it's 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 interesting. Also, just really quickly, 
Um, well, thank you, Mohammed, for uh, asking that question. And there is another question from Tage uh, Alvadi on the YouTube chat saying, explain quantum computing. Wait till next week. We've got some fun <laughs> stuff coming up. Can't say much more yet, but just wait till next week. And uh, I'm sure you're going to have a lot of fun on that episode. Um, we're getting pretty close to uh, the two-hour mark, and i got to say, this has been one of the most fun discussions on, on Tech Life Skills so far. I am loving being a guest on my own show now, finally. Yeah, I, I would say that you are quite a good guest. It's almost <laughs> as if you've done this before. I don't know. I mean, you've been on Tech Life once or twice before. I don't know. Um, but you, you seem like a natural. I don't know. Maybe maybe next episode you can host it and you know, have your own guest. Maybe, maybe going forward I can finally retire, You know, hang up the hat. Um, <laughs> With one episode so, under your belt. <laughs> <laughs> A <laughs> uh, quick um, note, we might have missed this question because it was pretty far up in the live chat, but I found yeah. it was pretty interesting. It's from Key, K-I. Um, they're asking, uh, branch prediction sounds really interesting. What are some good um, reading and learning material to learn about what CPUs do to optimize processes? Um, it's an interesting question. Here's the thing about it, though. The world of low-level programming, things like CPUs, uh, th that's um it's weird because i haven't really found myself those many great resources <laughs> it's 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 really just you know i'll be working on like a project like again that analyzer project and i'll be like hmm why does the if statement take so much less time than the actual checking of the condition and you know i'll notice that and i'll be like how is that possible the branch means you've got to like you know pull out of one branch and move to another and jump like how is that not less expensive and i realized well llvm was doing branch prediction for me um and, and it was sort of telling the cpu hey we're never going to be false so just start executing another branch immediately um and, and then i was like oh but then you know what if we were to you know reduce the the size of the buffer down to enough to fit in cache lines and you know all these things and it was sort of just Iteratively through experience, I would learn little bits and pieces of knowledge that I sort of amalgamated into what I know today. Um, but uh, th that that's unfortunate when it comes to low level resources. But I uh, that that's that's how I learned. Um, so there might be some more. I mean, I'm sure there are other other resources, but I haven't necessarily used them myself, uh, so I can't really comment immediately. Um, if I do find more, I will go ahead and put them in the comments, and I'll go ahead and tag you as well, so that you can uh, so that you get a notification. So. When I find more, I'll put them in the comments for this video. But that's that, that's that's one. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of unfortunate, but yeah. Also, just by the way, really quick note: my my yeah. host instincts are coming back. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> there there are like lots of questions, which is great. That means there's more scope for another Ask Tanme episode. But I do want to take up maybe one more question from the audience, and then of course, Michael, you're the host. I'm at your disposal after that. Um, but uh, uh, there is one more question that I want to take up from. Rishika, um, because uh, they're asking, what are your views um, on AlphaGo as opposed to Jeopardy? This one came in some time ago. Um, and just, I'm going to make this one brief. I think AlphaGo is great. It's innovative. It's complex. But it's not as interesting to me as Jeopardy was. And the reason I say that is because even though it's a brand new concept, it still makes sense that it would work. Right? It still makes sense that a computer would be able to play that. Um, and the reason I say that is because there's a very, very clear sort of objective or end state. Right? And I've got to say, it's less clear than in chess. Like in chess, you can very easily say the king's gone, you won. Um, but in Go, it's a little bit more sort of human driven. Right? It's, it's being able to say, I control this territory. And if there's a dispute, then you continue to play until you resolve the dispute. Um, so it goes a lot more human than chess is, and so that's why that sort of difficulty comes uh, comes in. But then you get to Jeopardy, and that's just a whole new level, right? There, you can never really say, I objectively know this is the right answer, no matter what. You could have an incorrect source even, right? It could be that your source is wrong, right? It could be that it's just worded weirdly and you don't understand the question. It could be that the source is worded weirdly and you don't understand what it's trying to say, uh, right? Like, uh, I, I feel like one of the best examples would be under the category of U.S. cities, uh, there was a Jeopardy clue about um, two airports, uh, and the real answer is what is Chicago, but Watson says what is Toronto under U.S. cities. <laughs> and, and people are like, 
what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> and it's, it's pretty simple because the machine learning algorithms behind Watson said that, hey, usually Jeopardy category names aren't really that helpful because they're mostly just puns and jokes, whereas the actual clues are useful. So just across all categories, it would mostly ignore input from the category. And therefore, in this case, even when the category was useful, it was still ignoring it. Right. So th there's because it's so much more of a human task, there's no clear objective end state. That's what makes Jeopardy at Watson and also IBM Project Debater infinitely more interesting to me than things like AlphaZero. Although I will say AlphaZero is still an incredible piece of technology. I don't mean to downplay how impressive that is. I'm just also really hyping Watson playing Jeopardy and, and, and Project <laughs> Debater just because I, I personally love those, those two examples. So that's, uh, those are my views. But go ahead, Michael. <laughs> All righty, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, um, that is, I believe that is all we have today for our golden boy in the yellow. Um, <laughs> Literally. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Those of you who are still here, those of you who left early, those of you who stopped in late, those of you who came in early, everybody for, for stopping in, asking your questions, listening in to the questions that you didn't even ask. We apologize if we did not get to your question. If you could see the chat, there's some people who are, are spamming and, and, and their questions can be flying by pretty quickly. We do apologize, but hang on to your seats uh, because that just means that there's room for another one. Yes. So I'd like to... Thank everyone for coming in. Thank you, Tanmay, for uh, being an amazing guest. Uh, I think you should do this a lot more often. Um, definitely, maybe maybe host your own your own podcast. You know, call it Tech Life Skills or something. I don't know. Um, so, th just thank yous all around to everybody. That's the Canadian way. We just say thank you a bunch. Um, so, if of course, if you have any questions, you can continue to ask them in the comments. Uh, you can email questions for another session if that ever happens, when that ever gets announced, whatever, whatever. Tanmay will tell you more about that. Be sure to stay tuned to Tanmay's channel because later today he does have those deep learning videos coming out. Uh, you guys are going to be very excited for those. Um, and stay tuned for next week uh, where there will be a lot more discussion on quantum computing. And I believe that is all there is to say. So thank you for stopping by. If Tanmay, you want to end off with some closing words? Totally. I mean, first of all, thank you, Michael. You've been an amazing, uh, amazing host, you know, through your, the thoughts that you've shared. I mean, I don't go to universities. So some of the thoughts you've shared have been, have been, have been pretty insightful. I got to say thank that. You. <laughs> and, and, you know, just generally being able to moderate all this and, and stuff is, is, is incredible because I feel like this is something that people have been asking for for some time. I mean, there have been so many questions, even just in this live stream that, you know, we've gotten the opportunity to answer and there's still so many more. So I can't yeah. wait for the next one. Uh, it's going to be really fun. And I mean, you know, you, you mentioned the Canadian way of it, it, is just saying thank you a bunch and you know sometimes i'll be going through the subtitles uh that youtube automatically transcribes for the for the for the episodes and i'll be like did we say thank you that much at the end <laughs> uh, 64 but... really? <laughs> <laughs> why is it a power of two no um <laughs> so 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 yeah it, it, it's just been really fun um and i can't wait for the next one there are lots of really fun episodes of tech life skills planned um that are that are coming very soon you know all the way from quantum computing to compilers to you know researchers in ai um to even students coming on later this month as well so i'm sure you're all going to have a lot of fun please do stay tuned of course michael as you mentioned uh there's also the ai series that's being launched uh later tonight on the youtube channel as well um so please do stay tuned for that and of course we're going to be moving this episode one hour behind 10 a.m est next week onwards thanks to daylight savings time so everybody else in the world can join too um and so <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a really fun episode. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. I really do appreciate it. And thank you very much, Michael, for being a, a great host. Thank you Goodbye, very much everybody. for your time. Have a good one. Thanks.